We will now begin the Boynton Beach City Commissioner's meeting today, Tuesday, April 3rd, 2018 at 6.30 p.m. Would everyone please rise for invocation, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Vice Mayor Christina Romulus. This is from SeawardUMC.com. God, Great Spirit, we become aware of your presence with every breath. You are around us and within us, coming from the east and south, from the west and north. From without and within, and in the certainty of your constant consistency, we offer this prayer. God, Great Spirit, with the rising of the sun in the east, you bless us with each new day, shining your light, illuminating all that is. May we work for the day when the light of your love shines in every heart, and the children of God in every land may live together in the harmony and peace that you intended from the very beginnings of this time at the very dawning of this light. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. May I have a roll call, please? Mayor Stephen B. Grant. Here. Vice Mayor Christina Romulus. Present. Commissioner Justin Katz. Here. Commissioner Mac McCray. Here. Commissioner Joe Casello. Here. All present. Are there any additions, deletions, or corrections to the agenda? Um. I'd actually like to add a few items. Uh, one to the, the future agenda um, regarding the bike share program for the city. Uh, not necessarily having timeline, just to have it there so that the city knows that we were looking forward to having a, a bike share program. Um, last year we had a preliminary budget workshop and I'd like to have that on May 29th. And so I would also want to put that on the future agenda item. It's the fifth Tuesday in May. And so that is, you know, a publicly noticed meeting so that we can hear from both the, the, the community and the CRA districts what they would like to see before uh, July's budget hearing where most things are finalized. Um, in addition, I'd like to put under new business A. Um, is to talk about the opioid lawsuit. Um, no, I'm sorry, the guns lawsuit that uh, 10 cities in Miami, Dade, and Broward have um, filed against Tallahassee. And then also, I've been getting questions regarding the lawsuit for the opi against the opioid manufacturers. And I want to know, uh, Jim, do you can you provide an update today or next meeting? Okay. And so we'll put that an update of the class action suit. I'd, I'd request that the, the city gun challenge be put on future agenda items too because I haven't seen or read anything in specific about it and I wouldn't want to be put in the position to vote today. I could give you Personally. some information on that next time as well. We, uh, our law firm does represent some cities that are involved in it. So okay. I'll have some information for you. Yes. And I'd like what to be placed on future agenda items, the lawsuit as well, because I heard it this morning laying in bed, you know, on Channel 12, you know, about Boynton was going to join. I'm like, whoa. So I'd like to hear something as well. Yes. Mayor, since you're absent on the 17th, we'll put it for the first meeting in May. Okay. Both discussions. Is that okay with the board? Unless uh, the board wants to have it without me. Right. Well, so uh, I'll, t is you know, the first meeting in May okay then? Uh, no, we'll do it on we'll the. We'll do it on 17th? Yep. And okay. I'll just watch the YouTube. Okay. All right, may have uh, um, approval as amended. So moved. moved. Second. Thank you. All those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Seeing none, the agenda, uh, amended agenda has been approved. All right, going on to informational items by members of the city commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Katz. Uh, none to report. Commissioner McRae. Thank you, sir. I, I don't have any information items. I'm just saying in regards to myself, but I do like to give some kudos to the staff. I'm just saying we don't do enough of this. I'd like to say to uh, Frank Ireland, Carolyn Sim Center, and Latasha Clemens, and the men and women of our fire department who took the, the little ones uh, and taught them and trained them, you know, what fire fighting was all about. I got a chance to witness their love and compassion. One day when I was passing by, I stopped by a photo op. That's the first thing. I'd like to also thank Mary the Graffin and her staff for the Easter egg extravaganza. Although I wasn't their mayor and vice mayor, 
uh, I got a lot of phone calls about your presence <laughs> and what you all did, and I was like, wow, that's it, stepping up to the plate. I'd also like to give another kudos to a gentleman uh, who works in parks. Uh, I found this new hobby where I go fishing now. And uh, when we was fishing on the pier one day, he realized, he said, hey, Commissioner, we don't have a uh, trash can. I had to put our stuff in. I went back the next day, and that was a can out there. And I just wanted to say, that's what you call thinking outside the box. You know, we didn't have to bring it up. Did it on their own. I'd like to also thank the men and women of our Boynton Beach Police Department. That was a young lady who went to school before I went to school. She was a year behind me. That was an incident that happened at CVS Pharmacy. Well, this young lady was mentally disturbed. And a lot of her classmates was there looking. They said, well, what, let's see what the cops are going to do. They was professional. They talked her into doing what they said to. She was taken to 45th Street. And I had about 20 phone calls that morning saying for me to tell you all thank you. So I'm telling you all thank you. I would also like to say to my colleagues who sits up here with me, I'd like to say to you all thank you last time for your kind words. It went a long way. Thank you. As long as I know my work is not in vain, enjoy working with you all. Thank you. Vice Mayor Romulus. I always enjoy working with you, Commissioner McCray. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, uh, just a few things to disclose. I also uh, actually attended the Fire Academy graduation where I got to uh, see some amazing faces that are going to be our future here in the city of Boynton Beach. So uh, it was really exciting to be a part of that and, and, and uh, just really watch these kids and the videos that they were showing of these kids, you know, pull, you know, pulling water hoses and, and oh man, I mean, I, I don't even know if I could do some of that stuff that, that these 10 year olds were doing. So it was tremendous. So again, uh, kudos to uh, um, Deputy Chief Clemens for, for the program that she uh, had the vision to go forward with and, and actually bring to fruition and, and uh, shout out to Chief Joseph here and, and the other members of the fire department for volunteering. They were not paid for this. They volunteered their time, took extra time outside of their uh, busy lives to uh, just give back and really uh, pour into this ki these kids in our community. So it was tremendous and we hope that this is something that is an annual thing and not just a one-time uh, endeavor. And in addition to that, my family and I also attended the um, Easter egg extravaganza. Um, it was an excellent event. <laughs> excellent. <laughs> had to do it. Um, a tremendous <laughs> event. Uh, uh, unfortunately, if some of you had have uh, Twitter, you probably witnessed me doing a losing in a, uh, a sack hunt with my husband. Uh, I let him win, but, you know, anyway. <laughs> so, a uh, great event, again, thrown by our uh, Department of uh, um, Recreation, uh, Parks and Recreation. So, thank you to Wally. Thank you to uh, the team and all the work that they do to make that event a success. And I'm uh, also happy that it was at, at the Hester Center this year. So, uh, also giving our, our uh, children in District 2 the opportunity to um, just walk right over and be a part of that event. So great turnout, um, tons of families from all over the city and outside of the city also participated in that. So great work to our city and we hope that th these things keep happening and keep bringing pride to our city. Thank you. Commissioner Casello. Yeah, staying in the same vein as the uh, fire department. Uh, in the next couple of days we're going to have a firefighter from Key West. He is making a uh, foot journey up to Tallahassee and uh, to be, bring awareness to cancer. And uh, he'll be stopping here in Boynton Beach uh, tomorrow. He'll be stay, staying at Station 4, then continue his trek up 1A. So if you see a bunch of firefighters on 1A walking tomorrow, uh, give them a toot and shout out and encourage them along. Thank you. On um, March 21st, I attended the meeting over at Cobra, uh, and on the 23rd, I uh, went to the Sea Mist. Um, it's a, it was a great uh, day out for fishing. Um, my cousin got uh, over 20 plus pound mackerel. Uh, and then I attended the Junior Fire Academy, and I mentioned that we might be doing this more on a routine basis, having summer programs and other um, weeks when there is no school. So that's something that we would have to look into for the budget. Um, on the Monday the 26th, I met with the head of international sales for the Bahamas Paradise Cruise Line. Um, on the 28th, I attended our COP Volunteers event over at the Intracoastal Park Clubhouse. Uh, went to uh, the League of Cities and also we had a green energy workshop on the, the 28th and we will also have another, uh, not a green energy, but a 
sustainability and resiliency workshop on April 25th uh, of this month. And one of the things that I mentioned is that we are going to start a sustainability and resiliency task force. And so if anybody who would like to join or anybody who knows someone else that they would like to join, please send me an email uh, regarding that such. On the 29th, I attended the Palm Beach County Transportation Planning Agency Steering Committee. Um, the Transportation Planning Agency is going from a county-run organization to an independent-run organization. Um, and one of the main reasons why we're doing this is so that the organization can have the final say with what it does with its money. And, and one of the other things is for the advocacy and lobbying efforts and uh, it is expected that uh, their city members is going to pay a, t a fee of 10 cents per resident, um, which would help benefit the, the TPA. On the 30th, I attended the FPL event for their emergency operations center in uh, Greater Boynton Beach. Um, on the 31st, I attended the egg extravaganza as well. Uh, I think it was done very well. Um, and Mary DeGraffenwright, you did a great job. And then that evening, I attended the, Boynton Be the first ever Boynton Beach Reggae Fest. And it was a phenomenal event. Um, we had a great crowd, great vendors. And I look forward to having, bringing them back into uh, Boynton Beach in the future. I wish everyone uh, a great Easter and Passover holiday. And in addition, I have spoken with uh, Gulfstream Goodwill Industries regarding a recommendation for them for another city. And in the past, I've spoken to the Florida Textile Recycling Program. In addition, I spoke with Mayor of Hypoluxa, Michael Brown, regarding a water agreement between the city of Boynton Beach and Hypoluxa. And before I move on, is there any other informational items from the commission? Yes. Thank, thank you. I just need clarification. The task force that will be created. This is not going to be an advisory board. Correct. We Thank would like you. to, is, instead of making recommendations, we want to see them out there in the city of Boynton Beach doing things and making things better for all of us. All right. <laughs> Moving on to announcements. Announcement of the 13th annual Boynton Beach Firefighter Fishing Tournament and Firehouse Chili Cook-Off on April 21st, 2018 by Chief Glenn Joseph. Good evening, everyone. Glenn Joseph, Fire Chief. I just want to one statement about the uh, Youth Academy. It was a joint venture between the Rex and Parks and the Fire Department, and they played an integral role. I just want to make sure they're recognized for their role in putting on that ex exciting uh, program. Uh, I'll introduce you to Chris Lemieux. He's the chairperson of the tournament, so I'll let him speak about it. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Lemieux. Uh, raised in Boynton Beach. I've uh, been with the Fire Department for the past 11 years. Um, I am uh, took over their chair last year for the fishing tournament. Uh, I've been involved since day one um, for 13 years, actually prior to my being hired for the city. Um, last year, we raised over $12,000 for our charities, which is Boynton Beach uh, Kiwanis Club, which we thought was fitting and gives back to the community. All the, you know, the charity money stays in the community, which is great. We have a lot of local businesses involved. Um, this year's event is going to be great. As usual, we're, we have everybody in line. Um, it's on April 21st of this year over at Boynton uh, Harvey Oyer Park, 2010 North Federal Highway. Um, if anybody would like to join, even if you don't fish, we would love having everybody out there. Chili teams, um, we had 18 chili teams last year and we had 126 boats participate in our fishing tournament last year. So, um, great event. Um, ran, it's run by all, all of our employees and everybody that works at the city. And if anybody wants to help, come out. Just say, hey, I want to help. And find me. Well, we'll put you to work. That's for sure. So I uh, hope to see everybody there, and we thank the commission, we thank the chief, everybody for their continued support, and we hope to see you guys there. Question. Yes. Thank you. I have a question. That is, uh, well, Commissioner Casella, will you be a judge again this year? I have been for the last three years. I look forward to it. Okay. Great. Oh yeah. I, I believe some of you are, are chili judges this yes. year, correct? <laughs> All right. Correct. And if anybody's interested or has any, there's some flyers in the back. Um, the entry form for the chili team. We need also. We're always looking for new chili teams. If anybody's interested, come on out. If anybody has a boat and wants to fish and participate, go for it. So, thank you very much. 
Next, uh, a certificate of achievement from myself to Takira Poole, a recent career online high school graduate. Microphone. I want to say thank you. I'm proud of myself for achieving this, the next step in my career. Oh my, I'm just, I don't know what to say. <laughs> thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, Craig Clark, Library Director. I just want to say how, I'm, how incredibly proud of this young lady I am. Uh, very <laughs> proud of her. She um, overcame some ob obstacles in her life, and here she is with her high school diploma, and she's going to be moving on to college soon. And um, my hat's off to her. It really gives me great joy uh, seeing her uh, work hard and and. Be, and be successful. So, Jeannie Taylor, librarian. I just want to say if anybody else knows someone who needs to get their high school diploma, as long as they're an adult over 19 years old, um, there's some bookmarks in the back with information on the program where you can look at it or come to the library and talk to me about it. We have more scholarships available. Before you all sit down, I'd like to say to, to Kira. I'd like to say thank you for your milestone that you have made. Is that your daughter? Thank you for leading by example. Perfect way to do it. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, three proclamations. We'll start them off. The first proclamation that we have is uh, for National Library Week. Proclamation, whereas libraries are not just about what they have for people, but what they do for and with people. Librarians continue to lead the way in leveling the playing field for all who seek information and access to technologies. And whereas libraries and librarians look beyond their traditional roles and provide transformative opportunities for education, employment, entrepreneurship, empowerment, and engagement, as well new services that connect closely with patrons' needs. And whereas libraries and librarians lead their communities in innovation, providing STEAM programming, maker spaces, and access and training for new technologies. And whereas libraries are pioneers supporting democracy and affecting social change with a commitment to providing equitable access to information for all library user users, regardless of race, ethnicity, creed, ability, sexual orientation, gender identity, or socioeconomic status. And whereas libraries lead in working with diverse communities, including people of color, immigrants, and people with disabilities, offering services and educational resources that tr transform communities and open minds and perform inclusion and diversity. And whereas National Library Workers Day, Tuesday, April 12, 2018, is a day for library staff, users, administrators, administrators, and friends groups to recognize the valuable contributions made by all library workers. Now, therefore, be resolved that I, Stephen Grant, Mayor, proclaim April 8th to, 8th to the 14th, 2018, as National Library Week. Thank you, Mary. Would you like to say a few more words? Sure. All right. I'd just like to thank the Commission and City Administration for their continued support of the library. We do great things there. And I also want to say thank you to all the great library staff. They're, they are what makes the library successful. So thank you very much. Uh, Craig, while you're there, I, I saw a, some, a notification about some changes in terms of uh, hold times that uh, patrons of the library can. Can you share that, please? Yes, sure. We have an updated borrowing policy. We've expanded our, our uh, borrowing privileges and the dates. Uh, you can now keep a book for three weeks instead of two weeks. You can keep a DVD for two weeks instead of one week. Um, you can now check up check out up to seven DVDs at one time instead of five, and a total of up to 30 items. Uh, and we've gotten some great 
reviews from the public coming in thanking us for uh, expanding the borrowing privileges. So, thank you. Put a hand clap. <laughs> Next, we have a proclamation uh, for the Paralyzed Veterans of America Month. Would National Vice President Charles Brown uh, please come down to accept the award? Is he here? No. All right. Proclamation. Whereas residing within the boundaries of Boynton Beach, many of our neighbors have served as members of the armed forces and in doing so honored our community with exemplary dedication. And whereas it is important that we recognize the sacrifices made by our community's veterans who are paralyzed. Now therefore, I, Stephen B. Grant, Mayor of the City of Boynton Beach, hereby proclaim the month of April as Paralyzed Veterans of America Awareness Month. In the city of Boynton Beach, I encourage the citizens of Boynton Beach to honor our paralyzed veterans because they, person they personify the highest ideals of service to country, sacrifice of self, and perseverance in overcoming adversity. Their stories of hardship and triumph provide life-affirming lessons for us, all of us. I also encourage the people of the city of Boynton Beach to observe and participate in the activities associated with PVA Awareness Month and reflect upon the sacrifices endured by our community's veterans who are paralyzed. There are many local community service organizations, particularly those serving our youth that seeks involvement in worthy projects. And PVA Awareness Month meets and surpasses that standards. In witness whereof, I have a... Yep, that's it. Next, we have proclaim, proclaim April 10, 2018 as Gopher Tortoise Day in the city of Boynton Beach. Does anyone want to accept Gopher Tortoise Day? Yay. <laughs> All right, proclamation. Whereas the gopher tortoise, Gopherus polyphemus, has been living on Earth for 500,000 to 2 million years, and whereas the gopher tortoise today is in the state of Florida state licensed as threatened and in parts of the U.S. is federally listed as threatened, and whereas the gopher tortoise is considered a keystone species, and whereas the gopher tortoise's burrow protects more than 350 other commensal species, some of which are listed as threatened, and whereas the gopher tortoise habitat need protection, and whereas having gopher tortoises and other species in our area helps us sustain the area's ecology and provide our citizens with a source of joy and appreciation for nature. Now, therefore, I, Stephen B. Grant, Mayor of the City of Boynton Beach, Florida, to hereby proclaim the 10th of April, 2018, as Gopher Tortoise Day. Do we have one? Uh, we do have one? Yes. Here? You can't touch them, right? Yeah, right. All right. <laughs> Would you like to say a few words? Sure, we'll say Good evening, Rebecca Harvey, Sustainability Coordinator. Thank you, Mayor and Commission, for this proclamation. Uh, Boynton Beach is joining at least 17 other Florida communities in proclaiming this year's April 10th, one week from today, as Gopher Tortoise Day to raise awareness of this species that, chain, that, that shares our habitat. Um, it is uh, listed as a threatened species in the state, and so both the tortoise and its burrow are protected by state law which is why we could not bring one with us this evening. Um, and, uh, but despite it being listed as threatened, the species is nothing if not a survivor. It li li lives for up to 60 or more years, and as the proclamation says, has been on Earth much, much longer than we have. And I um, had the pleasure of taking a little break this afternoon and walking uh, to the back of the property of the East Water Treatment Plant and, and saw a gopher tortoise. And it was just a nice way to get out of my office and take a break on a beautiful afternoon and appreciate nature in our own backyard, literally. Um, and I will turn it over to Glenda to say a little bit more. Glenda Hall, Forestry and Grounds Manager. We just wanted to share with you that Boynton has gopher tortoises inhabit, in, in habitats at Galaxy Sand Pine Preserve, Seacrest and Rosemary Scrub Natural Areas, the Nichols property, which is a future park site, the Sand Pine Preserves at Quantum, and the proposed Eco Park in Quantum, and of course the East Water Treatment Plant. And you can get more information at gophertortoisedayfl.com, or you can also pick up a flyer, which we have at the back that for, on the gopher tortoises. 
And I just wanted to add, I saw the largest burrow I have ever seen of a gopher tortoise. It had to be about this high, sand, and the gopher tortoise that I could see was about that big across. So we do have some wonderful ones with some age. So, thank you. Uh, I also have a sad announcement that's not on the agenda, that a former mayor, Michael V. Michael, passed away on February 1st, 2018 in Dixon, Tennessee. He was born in Franklin, North Carolina, and after college came to Boynton Beach as an entrepreneur and founded Michael's Nursery in Boynton Beach. Michael V. Michael was vice mayor in 1967, held the office of mayor from 1967 to 68, and was a councilman in 1969 to 70. Now I open up to public audience. Individual speakers will be limited to three minute presentations. Please state your name and address before you begin. Hi, Susan Oyer, 140 Southeast 27th Way. Um, I wanted to share, I didn't want to interrupt last commission meeting. I, I just briefly mentioned that Marie Shepard had passed, but I didn't want to detract from Ron Washman how wonderful he was. Um, I've known him since I was a child, and he used to be um, our, our youth director at church, so he needed his time to shine. Um, I did want to share about Marie Shepard. Um, there was an obit in the paper yesterday. It was really quite long. I'll share just the Boynton Beach part though. Um, she was an integral part of the Boynton community and, is, and one of the main things Marie will be remembered for. She was declared the healthiest baby in Palm Beach County in 1921. She grew up on First Avenue where the current police station is located. Her father, a pharmacist by education, ran a nursery of plants near the Intracoastal Waterway and her mother was a school teacher at the Boynton Elementary School. Her father died in 1932 when she was 11, leaving her mother alone to raise her along with her younger sister and older brother in the throes of the Great Depression. She attended Florida Southern College, which she continued to support throughout her life, and in 1997 was granted the Alumni Distinguished Service Award for Outstanding Service to Humanity. Returning to Boynton from New York City in 1976, Marie made significant contributions to the preservation of the town's history. She recalled interesting events and people of her life in wonderful narrative form. Um, Marie was one of the most valuable and successful presidents of the Boynton Women's Club and had a reputation of being the go-to person um, if smart practical common sense was needed and, and my understanding is she's one of the people who, who and this is not in here, um, helped get the funding to put it on the National Registry and was behind that. Um, let's see. As president of the Women's Club Historic Preservation Foundation, she was a key player in securing funds from the Florida state government as well as private donations in restoring the Meisner building to its original status. She also worked diligently as part of the Boynton Elementary School, now the Museum School. The town of Boynton even declared a day in her honor, Marie Shepherd Day, which is October 17th. Um, and that's all that really pertains to Boynton Beach and her a bit, but I just thought this should be part of the record because she is one of our great f leaders in our city's history and I don't want her to be forgotten just because she was 90 something when she died and had been in a nursing home or, you know, kind of hidden away for the last 10 years. So, so many people do not know her, but she is an um, integral part of our city's history. So thank you. How you doing? David Katz, 67 Midwood Lane, our fair city. My first question is if somebody uh, maybe from administration could tell me what the status of the board dinner were, uh, that was uh, funded this past budget year that we're supposed to be having. Advisory board dinner? Yeah, we still have to plan it. It's in this year's budget. We're probably okay. going to okay. look at September. Okay, September. Yeah, because so right. I, don't, I don't think we want to do it over the summertime. Judy and I were just talking about it, so we'll probably, I think okay. August is still too soon, so maybe September. Thank you. Um, curb stoning is against law in the city of Boynton Beach. A while back, I informed uh, Mr. Woods and his department about curb stoning that was happening on Hypoluxo Road on the expanse of Swale, which is just outside the apartments in the meadows in that back entrance. And um, he told me out in the lobby after a meeting that it was the police department's responsibility, not his department. Uh, curb stoning occurred again uh, this past weekend. And these people are smart. They put them out Friday night. They take them away Sunday evening. And I called the PD about it. 
and the person who, answer, who I ended up speaking to, I don't think it was dispatcher, it might have been an officer, but I'm not sure, uh, he informed me that it's Mr. Wood's department who's supposed to do it. I'd like either maybe the chief or Mr. Woods to come up, maybe possibly at, at your request, and explain who does it, who enforces curb stoning. I mean, there was a car parked there without any tag. Should have been towed. And it's, it's not right. It's not right. Silence. Staff can direct it, the appropriate entity. I don't think that, I don't. My, it's my, a collaborative my, effort on both, both departments. I'm hard-pressed to believe. No, I, that's not appropriate under public audience, but it's, it's a collaborative. It, we were, it requires the police department's assistance to be able to run tags because of access to delicate information that our community standards officers are not permitted I'm to not access. Right. So we work together. Okay. Um, if I'm not mistaken, there's really no... Is it a criminal statute? I don't think it's a criminal statute for curb stoning, so it's a municipal ordinance. And so if it's a violation of municipal ordinance, it would be under the community standards. If right, but to run the tag information and have access to the vehicle when you approach it, it requires, it's so NCIC, be, FCIC. So you're saying community standards can no longer so, do right. that because they're not part of police? No, because they're not sworn officers, and I think they have to be trained and have specific access to the NCIC. So I mean, he has to run it. Okay, there's a David program that I think... Maybe it's part, yeah, I don't know which acronym. All right, so, but by next, you'll let us know how to get, take care of this. Thank well, you. Well, it would seem to me that uh, if, give me a few more yeah. seconds here, if uh, community standards doesn't work on the weekends, which I was informed about, that if a police officer would ride by on the weekend, just one ride by, uh, drive by, sorry, and uh, take a look, I mean, they could have had the, the Toyota Camry that was parked out there with no tag on it. They could have had a towed. And it's the other, the other vehicle, which was a van, had a dealer tag on it. So that's who's doing it. And I'd appreciate the cooperation of city staff to take care of it. Thank you. Good evening. Minister Bernard Wright, President of Bernard Wright Ministry, the Robert E. Wells Foundation, and Real Talk Radio. Uh, that fire academy, I want to say it was awesome. I was there every day. My child was a participant. It was great. I want to commend everyone who participated in that. We need more of that to God be the glory for the children. And talking about the children, uh, being a community advocate, I brought before you all attention about the children being deprived and having no free access to that Callan Sim Center that was grandfathered in for the neighborhood during not only summertime but spring break either. We have an uh, officer's neighborhood program that's doing great with the children, but uh, last week they couldn't be with their children because the children could not even go in to use the restroom nor even either get a drink or water. And, and that is not good. I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's just. I really don't think it's illegal. Uh, they're running a daycare. They call it spring break, spring camp. They call it summer camp, but it's under daycare regulations where I haven't seen in the paperwork, which I would like a copy of, that the public cannot mango with the spring break and summer camp children, which costs about $500. Uh, with scholarship, it's 100 and something because I have my child out there every year. However, I didn't know until last year that children in the public and the resident could not participate and have free access to that center at all with the computer room, the game room. We just got new pool tables. And the officers program, they're doing gardening out there. They read with the children before they get into the game room coming out of Ponciana every uh, day, which is a great thing. And I'm in children ministry, and this is a very great concern concerned of mine, and last week I did not get not one response from the dais. Uh, I don't really appreciate that, and that's why a lot of us do not come down here, because when we bring relevant issues to you all, after electing you all, we don't even get no type of response. Uh, I trust y'all would take that on advisement, and let's fix this before summer, so these children don't be in the street and be subjected to that this, that goes on in the street when we're trying to curb crime and trying to raise our children, you know, with the best, you know, for growth and development. Uh, do I get any feedback from you all about this situation tonight? I'll be glad to respond. Thank you. Um, first, it is legal for the city government to run a camp program on one of our facilities. Um, two, in order for the paying customers of these programs to have their children enrolled, there have to be some rules about people who are not affiliated with the program entering the facility. So. Um, it's a service we provide our residents, and it's well attended and well received, so I don't anticipate anybody planning on killing the children's camp program anytime soon. I'm not asking that it be killed, oh. per se. Come on. But these children shouldn't be deprived of access to a center they have had access to. It was built for them 
all these years, decades, and all of a sudden now these black children cannot go to this recreation center during the summer. Come on, Mayor, please. The, have something to say the issue about is, this. is that the alternatives is that you know for our senior center it is a free for all. Uh, seniors within the city of Boynton Beach to go and attend. The, the, most likely we're not going to have a library, so it seems that it would be up to uh, Parks and Rec's department to have an alternative place if they are not able to go to the Carolinson Center for the children to be during the day or in the afternoon. Oh, you mean neighborhood children to go no, another a mile, two miles to, to play? I mean, yeah. seriously? There has to, you know. Uh, but you're running otherwise. these camps in every one of your centers, recreation departments. The Civic Center, the Hester that's, Center. That's, that's all we can So ask. the public doesn't have anywhere to go, none of the children. I don't think, you, you don't think this should be addressed? Thank you very much. To God be the glory. Good evening, Harry Woodworth, 685 Northeast 15th Place, Boynton Beach, Florida. I just want to give you an update on some of the things I've talked about here over the last few months. U-Haul, uh, um, you've all heard about the U-Haul issue in our neighborhood for years. Sergeant Hawkins has done an amazing job of keeping their business on their property and out of the bicycle lane and blocking the U-turns up there. Uh, it's going in the right direction. Uh, there's a lot of room for improvement because that business is about half again the size of the property it's on. So whenever they're busy and like this Monday, the bicycle lane was blocked uh, pretty much most of the day, but that's not Sergeant Hawkins' issue. Uh, I guess from the commission perspective, if you guys are talking to DOT, if you're not going to fix that problem up there, don't bother putting a bike lane down Federal Highway because it's useless. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. If you can't use the bloody thing, why put it there? Uh, the other thing is we've talked about derelict boats in our neighborhoods. Uh, just give you a little update on that and a could-do to the Boynton Beach Police Department. They rescued one of them about a week ago. Um, They've all broken their moorings now. Every single one of them has drifted free and been rescued or smashed into a dock or a seawall. This one, the Boynton Beach Police and the Marine Patrol got to about 50 feet before it took out a guy's dock. Uh, if we're going to leave these derelict boats, I'm sorry, at risk, they're not derelict till they sink, uh, these boats have no propulsion, no ability to go anywhere without being towed. They're throwing their sewer overboard in buckets. Okay, they're not displaying Coast Guard required navigation lights. Some are, some aren't. Most turn them off when nobody's around. Uh, if we're going to let them sit there until hurricane season, which is now 90 days away, maybe we should have a derelict boat day so we can honor these people because they're going to be there forever. And it's just ridiculous. I mean, we, the law is on our side. At risk vessels, Florida statute has provisions for dealing with it. Coast Guard anchor lighting is well documented. Locking up your sewer lines by the Coast Guard is mandatory inside of coastal waters, and yet there they sit, throwing their buckets overboard, and I watch it from about 100 feet off my dock. It's unbelievable. Um, I just don't understand why we can't get on top of that. I really can't. I spent the weekend out in my front yard putting down 200 bags of mulch so it would look good for the people from the sober home walking by and from the vacationers next door in the rental. It's really sad, guys. Thanks. Lucas Vogel, 1090 Southwest 24th Avenue. I've had the privilege of joining the uh, Planning and Growth Commission a couple months ago. It's been a great experience. I've learned a lot uh, about the way the city works. Uh, I've got a couple of points that are coming up in tonight's meeting uh, that I just kind of wanted to address that I've been indirectly involved with. Uh, the first one is the, uh, the rezoning of uh, federal. <clears throat> in our last meeting, we discussed the uh, Boynton One project and the rezoning for that. I know a lot of this is uh, considered housekeeping or house, house cleaning, uh, which is all well and good. However, I would like to remind the, the commission that uh, you're rezoning the entire federal highway corridor between Woolbright and Boynton. Uh, we've got a lot of development projects already underway, and I would just like to kind of appeal to the, the commission to at least maybe consider tabling the any further rezoning for a while until we get uh, everything built and we can assess for ourselves the impact of the uh, project that we already have underway before we consider uh, completing that rezoning process. The second issue I'd like to bring up is the town center. I've been looking for information about the, uh, the financing of this project. Uh, I found it to be rather lacking in detail. Um, <clears throat> I'm really looking for more information about the public-private partnership that we have with the development agencies 
and how that's going to work from a financial aspect. Uh, like most people that live in the city, I'm very concerned about my own taxes. Uh, I feel I, I pay a pretty good amount. I don't want to see that going up anytime soon. Um, I'm not able to really find a lot of information about that. So <clears throat> if there's anything that you can do to help point me in the right direction for getting a better understanding as to how we're going to pay for the, the entire $250 million, I know we're not on the hook for all of that, but I like a better understanding of the details behind that. I can find details for days about the high school remodeling. I can find it about the playground that's coming into place. I can't find any information about how we're paying for any of this. So until I can find that, uh, I'm probably going to take the minutes from tonight's meeting and I'm probably going to file an appeal with the city attorney in the morning. So thank you very much. I'll give you back your time. Yep. Thank you. Before we move on, <clears throat> in regards to derelict boats, I'm just saying that sits in the district that I represent. I'd like the staff to get some information and tell me what can be done legally by the city of Boynton so that I could be abreast so that I could make sure that we're at least getting something done legally. I'm just saying I fish and I'm just saying when I'm hearing this sewer going over, I'm getting a little nervous now. I've just recently um, spoken to, to Jim and asked him to do some research to see if there's a little bit more aggressive action we can take. And um, here and there may be, so we determine what that is, Commissioner. Thank you. I'll get, get Once you all get the information, you. get it yep. back to us. Will Thank do. you. Not only me, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. And I was going to ask staff to, to try to acquire uh, Mr. Vogel's uh, information to provide him that, but it appears Colin has already taken the initiative. That's what I asked him to meet him outside. <laughs> so good job. That's the best person uh, we can get all that information from. So thank you, Colin. And we're, we're just so commissioned. As we're still finalizing signatures on the, I don't know how many documents we have flowing right now, probably 10, or 10 to 13. As soon as those signatures, there are people out of state, we're chasing all that down from the commission approvals from the workshop. All those uh, documents will be posted on our web, will be available through a link on the website. They're not up yet because we just don't have them all the signatures, so we'll get them up there. And if I guess anybody wanted it, they could do a Freedom of uh, Information Act. Yeah. All right. Uh, seeing no more public announcements, moving on to administrative. Um, we have. Uh, no applicants. The, the boards available are the Arts Commission, the Building Board of Adjustments and Appeals, the Employee Pension Board, and the Senior Advisory Board. Next is proposed resolution number R18-051, appoint a city commission representative and alternate to the countywide intergovernmental coordination program. My question is, I need to know, I'm just saying from staff on these, can you all tell us who's serving and who's the alternate? I, I'm just saying that if the person who's serving as the person and the alternate, if they don't have any problems, you know, my take is that continue to serve since we're all still sitting up here. I'm currently serving as a representative for this board. I don't mind uh, remaining in that post. Yes. Commissioner Kess. Um, I would just request this is the first time because I'm no longer in the, the classroom that uh, I'm able to get flexible scheduling during the day that... Um, I'm under the presumption that Commissioner Casello may be leaving the commission in November. I know that he is the current COBRA representative. I wouldn't mind uh, taking the alternate slot. Um, I worked at Park Vista High School in the COBRA territory for the past 10 plus years um, and have strong ties to the residential community. So I would, I would definitely appreciate uh, taking over once he elevates himself to a higher office. All right. Um, Absolutely. Do you want to, we'll do it in order though? Yeah, let's do it in order. Okay. So may I have a nomination for Vice Mayor Romulus to serve as the regular for the countywide intergovernment coordination program and uh, City Manager Laveria to be the alternate? Oh. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Next we have... Uh, the MPO that has changed its name to the Transportation Planning Agency, so the city next year will have to update these documents. Um, I'm serving on it. I'm currently serving on the steering committee for the independents. I'd like to continue my seat. And Mac, uh, I'm sorry, Commissioner McRae, would you mind uh, being the alternate? I've been called worse. No problem. Yeah, let's continue the way we're going. So move. All right. Okay. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes unanimously. 
Next, appoint a sitting commission representative and alternate to the League of Cities appointment. Uh, Mayor, uh, I'd like to continue in that position for the time being, but uh, I will also be resigning that seat in the near future, so. The alternate. Did I? I am? Yes. Oh, well, then how about that? i got to step up to the plate. So move. All right. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 And last is the COBRA appointment. And yeah, as, as was previously uh, mentioned by uh, Commissioner Katz, I, I'd like to continue there until uh, the time that yeah. uh, I resign. There is the alternate. And uh, Commissioner Katz is up be the alternate. Yes, sir. Yeah. So move. All right. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Moving on to consent agenda, is there any item that would like to be uh, pulled from the consent agenda? Motion to approve. Second. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Seeing none, motion passes unanimously. Bids and purchases over 100000 Proposed resolution number R18-058. Um, since this was an RFP, I'm going to let Tim uh, explain it. Good evening, Mayor and Commission. Uh, Tim Howard, Assistant City Manager. What you have in front of you is the city went out with an RFP for a textile uh, recycling franchise. Um, in the RFP, uh, we allowed for uh, two options. Option A was an exclusive for citywide um, franchise, and option B was exclusive for city-owned property franchise. Uh, the city received two proposals, one from Florida Textiles and one from Goodwill Industries. Uh, there was a review committee that evaluated the proposals and the options that they proposed on. Florida Textiles proposed for option A and option B. Goodwill Industries proposed for option B alone. Uh, based on the city's re uh, evaluation committee review, based on the criteria that was in the RFP, what the committee is recommending to the commission is to, they're recommending option B, which is city-owned city owned property exclusive franchise, um, and to enter into an agreement with Goodwill Industries. Um, it's a recommendation from your review committee. The city commission has the authority to either accept their ranking, proceed with the agreement with Goodwill Industries. You have the um, authority to decide to go with a city-wide option if you'd like. You can request each of the proposers to come and give you a proposal or a presentation, and you can make a decision of what um, option and what vendor you'd like to go with. Uh, Mr. Howard, exclusively city-owned properties. Give me uh, examples of what properties these goodwill boxes would be on. Could be on um, City Hall. It could be on. So we'd have a goodwill box out here at City Hall. Could, they would work with staff to determine where. Um, could be at the museum, could be at the Hester Center, um, any city-owned property. Could be at a park. Do you think that's a good idea to have goodwill boxes at parks and somewhere? I'm just here to report the results of the RFP that the commission requested to go out on the street. Okay, so, so just strictly city-owned properties? Correct. So it wouldn't be shopping centers or Correct. spread out through the whole right. area? That option was just city-owned properties. City-owned properties. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Tim, I'd like to know who served on that review committee. Sure. It was um, Andrew Mack, Director of De Development, Mike Rump, Planning and Zoning Director, and Wally Majors, Director of Recreation and Parks. So one other question. Mm -hmm. uh, how many meetings did they have? I'm sorry? The, how many meetings did they have to make this decision? Um, the process is they receive the proposals, they individually review them, then in a public meeting they rank, they score them based on the criteria in the RFP, and publicly they're summarized as far as the score. So it was one meeting to um, rank them. Okay, one meeting to rank them. They yeah. did not meet jointly. This is what I'm trying to, did they No, meet? they review individually not and then they do one two. public okay. meeting that's open to the public. And I believe both proposers are here in case anybody has a question for them. Um, the review committee is subject to the sunshine. Correct. Answers just so the commission knows. So I can't okay. Um, you know, my question regarding um, if we go only for city owned, does that prevent um, any, um, I guess, business from going to private um, lots or businesses and have their own according to our statutes? Yeah. No. Not prohibit. 
So that means that we could have some on city-owned property and as many as within our, within our I guess, codes because we're going to have to create new ones for this. I, I think what you see out there now is um, Andrew may reference the current code, but there are some um, containers out there now on uh, school properties, I believe, and some places of worship. Um, but the city would be only entering into a city-owned property franchise. Okay, um, because I think they do have it at other places like a Walgreens or, and so, you know, and that's kind of where I believe, I don't know, it may have taken away, but I believe the, the Walgreens are like Woolbright and Congress used to have a donation box. And so. So, um, we believe that we know they're out there. I don't know if they're permitted or not permitted at this point. Okay, and so when we do it with, I guess, city-owned, we are st are we going to start enforcing it city-wide then still? This franchise would just, the city would partner with, with the entity for city-owned property only. Okay, thank you. Commissioner McRae, and then... Uh, thank you, sir. I, I need to know, do we have Goodwill uh, collection boxes already in the city? I don't know, no, to be honest no. with you. No, no. Permitted they say no. <laughs> yes. So just to, to to reiterate or, or try to get a restatement because uh, I'm not completely clear. If we if we accepted a, a city owned property only, would that or would that not prohibit anyone else from putting these containers on private property, not city owned property? Mike Rump, Planning Zone Director. There are standards and rules in our LDRs right now um, that mandate or guide us in, in reviewing such containers. It does exist. Someone can come in today and get approval for a private property. Um, I think even probably on city property if we so choose, but that probably led us to this process in considering such action. Uh, it governs how many, it governs where they can be on a piece of property, it governs how big, it governs signage that are placed on them. So right now, the way your system is, that this would be separate from that process. Unless you direct staff to amend those regulations, that process would still exist. Um, it, I don't know if, if you know, um, one of the, the participants, Florida Textiles, might have to answer this question. The, the request uh, by goodwill would yield approximately a hundred thousand dollars is what the the backup documentation says and they're asking for only city owned property um, opportunities um, I'd like to request from from Florida textiles I don't know if I missed it in the backup potentially but what is the what's the potential revenue for the city on a, a citywide operation supported by Florida textiles because that's that's my main issue here is that we're trying to generate revenue from this at least that's you know my my support for for trying to control these and regulate these, and um, I'm curious if if what their potential citywide uh, you know haul would be, how much would that yield for the city if they're able to give an estimate? So the proposal from Florida Textiles um, on the citywide option was two thousand dollars a year per bin, and on city-owned property. It was $1,200 per bin per year. So it would be based on the number of bins that they would place. In order for them to do for citywide, it'd be, they would need to put 50 bins to match Gulfstream's city-owned property? Correct. Okay. Commissioner McRae? Thank you, Mayor. Let me go ahead and just say this. My take is that when we start placing bins, you know, and perhaps they're going to clarify, because I think we really need to hear from both presenters. My problem is that when I see bins placed out, whether they're on property or private property, I always see debris and stuff all thrown around them. And I'm like saying, you know, we're trying to do better in the city, and I'm just saying make sure that everything is kept up. And I'm like, I want to hear from the final. Who's going to be responsible for it? cleaning these things up, I'm just saying, you know, what are you putting out there? You know, I might come through one morning and see a sofa out there by a good bit. I, I'm, you know, I, I want to be serious about this. So, Commissioner Casella? Yeah, yes. just a quick question. So, what are we doing now to enforce the, one, the bins that are out there now that are not permitted? Why are we allowing them to be there if they're there? 
Well, again, Mike Rump, your planning zoning director, and let me think through this. <coughs> The agreement that if you were to approve an agreement... No, no, the ones that already exist. No, no, I just want to correct what I said before. Obviously, if you approve an agreement, an exclusive agreement with an entity, we'd have to amend our regulations because it would not be able to exist, coexist with such an agreement. So number two, as you know, our system is reactive. So if there's a complaint against one or staff obviously sees one and knows that it's not permitted, then we'd react. But otherwise, we're not necessarily on a hunt on a daily basis to identify those that are not in conformity with our program or with uh, without a permit. So we don't know how many are out there right now then? <clears throat> I could bring back to you or email you what we currently have as approved units, but I can't tell you that off the top of my head. Or total that are not conforming. If um, the board would allow, I think, you know, we have both uh, applicants here. Would you uh, be okay with a five-minute presentation from each applicant? I, I would be okay, and I'd like to also do a uh, disclosure. I did not meet with, I met early with this group, but I have not met recently with no one else. I'm just saying, so I'm good. Okay. Please. Is uh, everyone else okay with that? Getting to my head nods. Yep. All right. So, um, if Goldstream, would you mind giving us a, a five minute presentation similar to what you did uh, for our evaluation committee? Absolutely. And I'll, I'll be brief just to follow through a little bit with the application. My name is Brian Edwards. Uh, I work for Gulfstream Goodwill Industries, Vice President of Marketing and Development. We have our CEO here, Brian Iskowitz, and uh, Byrne, who is our Vice President of Donated Goods. And uh, what I can't cover, if you have a question in some technical uh, aspect of it, certainly they can stand up. But uh, first and foremost, for full disclosure, uh, Gulfstream Goodwill has spent the better part of uh, seven years plus uh, working very hard to ban donation bins uh, for a number of reasons. One, uh, uh, competitive for health and human services. Uh, we are the largest health, human service, social services nonprofit in Palm Beach County and, and throughout our five county jurisdiction. Uh, so providing those uh, services, not just for Gulfstream Goodwill Industries, uh, whether it's homelessness, uh, deaf services, vision services, homeless services uh, in terms of residential, uh, the revenues generated from what we do are any other nonprofit that has a thrift store a related entity, uh, obviously those revenues are very important to supporting those services. Uh, so that leads us to here. So this is a little awkward uh, from where we've been uh, in our travels in, in several of the municipalities throughout Palm Beach County, uh, including Palm Beach County, who have uh, uh, banned the boxes uh, for every reason that uh, Commissioner McCray mentioned from unsightly, unsafe uh, aspects uh, of, of what a, these uh, illegal uh, in, in most cases, for-profit donation bins have become uh, throughout our county. And in many of our uh, travels throughout the commissions across the county, and, and to include uh, Palm Beach County, you know, we've had for-profit companies that we've had to go head-to-head -head with that's flown in from Chicago, Atlanta, uh, San Francisco, and Orlando uh, who have uh, distributed these bins and, and placed them uh, illegal. So uh, in an effort to help support that, we do not have unattended donation bins. Uh, we have attended donation bins in, in Palm Beach County, now what we call inline donation centers, where they're attended, people get tax receipts, cleanliness, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and for uh, this proposal, and, and a couple <laughs> more that are uh, coming in like this, uh, we can't afford not to uh, bid. This is what Gulfstream Goodwill Industries and the Goodwill organization across the country has been doing for over 100 years and 52 years here in Palm Beach County in terms of uh, collecting donated goods, gently donated goods or salvaged goods, and uh, we process those materials and we use that revenue to help support uh, our uh, programs and services. Uh, throughout the county uh, for all municipalities. So uh, when the proposal came up, to try to answer the question in terms of our proposal, which hopefully you've, you've had an opportunity to peruse, uh, 
Uh, these donation bins, uh, every question I think that you asked, uh, Commissioner McCray, we, we've thought long and hard about. First, we do this every single day uh, with, with literally tens of millions of pounds of donated goods through our uh, outlet processing centers. Uh, whether it's uh, resold, repurposed in our stores, or whether it's uh, salvage and try to minimize uh, through what I'm assuming, both from a revenue generating standpoint and a, uh, you know, a sustainability going green kind of aspect of helping uh, the residents of Boynton Beach uh, have a convenient way of removing their textile products. Uh, we have, uh, applied with this not only the dollars uh, that we believe would hopefully meet the criteria that the city of Boynton Beach is looking for to include the programs and services we already provide but the uh, the manpower to uh, help sustain we've committed to a five-day uh, monitoring program the uh, RFP required that the boxes be clearly marked and co-branded with the city of uh, Boynton Beach and Goodwill. And uh, you require, as uh, what I thought was uh, a good thing since I'm a resident here, is that you know you have the hurricane tie downs and you have the cement blocks. So the safety aspect of what was going to be required. So the, uh, the fact that you're moving into a contract uh, with us or another entity, uh, you you have set guidelines uh, and standards that require us to make sure that we're uh, monitoring those boxes on a daily basis and that we're picking them up in, in a timely manner. What we're committed to for three, uh, is that five minutes? Uh, all right, for three days a week and, uh, and the personnel to back that up. So um, that's where we stand with the with a quick five-minute overview uh, in what we've uh, proposed in our packet for you. Yes, Commissioner Katz, do you have any questions? Yeah, um, one or two. Um, why, why only city-owned property versus more expansive? The, the real short answer to that, Commissioner Katz, is we are a nonprofit. We, look, we make a living raising money, writing grants like any other nonprofit, but we're the large, we have over 24 different services and programs. We run the Lewis Center for the county for the homeless program. Uh, we have a charter school for kids with disabilities right here in Boynton Beach. Uh, we have the traumatic brain injury program. We have vision pro. We took over deaf services when it shut down. We took over Lighthouse for the Blind when it closed at 70 years old. So every dollar that we bring in uh, goes toward our programs and services. So when you start uh, adding up the amount of cost that it would take for us anyway was a, a strong consideration. Uh, you start having to negotiate on public property, I mean private property. Uh, you wind up having to negotiate a fee uh, for what you're paying for to have your donation bin on. Uh, there, there's cost involved with that and seriously uh, we had to take that into consideration and therefore uh, we went with what we thought would be the most suitable option for us and uh, from a safety perspective, cleanliness, uh, and all those aspects, and we went with option B. Stated that your your stations would be manned? No, uh, by virtue of this requirement in your RFP, it, it would be, be an unattended donation ban, but we would love the opportunity uh, to negotiate for uh, attended donation centers in Boynton Beach. And you, you stated that um, it's, it's your participation in this in lieu of your position previously in, in trying to restrict or ban these types of, of containers is more of a defensive move to, so your, the potential income from this for, for your organization ex exceeds what you're, you're laying out presumably to, to acquire the contract? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, there's always the argument that there's enough to go around for everybody. Uh, what we're experiencing in the uh, textile uh, donated goods industry for nonprofits is that is not the case. Uh, so, you know, when, you, when you're in this business and it's a, a nonprofit but you're still in the business of doing business, 
uh, all competition. And, and part of our greatest growth in competitive edges in textile recycling comes from uh, for-profit organizations uh, like World Thrift, uh, Good Life, uh, other organizations that get out there. So, and, and when I say that, I, I think I can honestly speak on behalf of any other uh, nonprofit that is in the textile recycle, resale, repurpose uh, business. And just last one, um, what other local municipalities or counties has, has Goodwill pursued trying to prohibit the, the placement of these bins? We have uh, been almost to every municipality. Uh, we've been successful. Uh, a lot of municipalities already have bands on the bins, even before uh, we started traveling. But uh, West Palm Beach, uh, they, they did a ban about three and a half, four years ago. We approached their uh, commission. Uh, Lake Worth, uh, the Palm Beach County, uh, Jupiter, uh, I... I'd have to look at my list to pull it out, but quite a few. Uh, we've been very successful with banning the bins uh, for a number of reasons. Have Have any of those entities proceeded with banning, uh, you know, bins of this nature? I, absolutely, we were part of that process uh, with with their commissions during that process. Absolutely. And then the last one. Sorry, I keep going. Um, is it Is it fair to say that? an established entity in you know in this type of business seeking to ban competition you know is is trying to you know create a de facto monopoly so that granted you wouldn't have bins if you're trying to ban the bins but by banning other organizations bins you're you're boxing out competition for this this type of industry well, that's been a constant argument, uh, an argument in the, in the terms of uh, debate uh, throughout uh, the, at least my uh, six and a half years with Goodwill as, as far as monopoly goes. But every meeting we've ever attended, we've always been joined by other nonprofits. And I'll guarantee you if any other nonprofit in Palm Beach County could afford to initiate this process, they would have bid uh, both here and in Del Rey, because you know you are kind of protecting uh, your programs and services. So, in a sense, uh, that's what we're we're doing. You're trying to protect your business of of uh, what you're doing for health and human services. Uh, there's risk involved with that. We are not for profit, so it's not like the money just comes in. We give a hundred thousand to the city, and the rest goes into whatever. Uh, you know, for profit in there, that is entrepreneurship. And the only thing we've ever asked for from Gulfstream Goodwill Industries is a fair shot uh, to bid. Uh, just like uh, any for profit uh, competition we've been up against, they've all, always just asked for a fair shot. But I can tell you this we put well over a hundred thousand dollars into almost any. Uh, municipality in Palm Beach County. Uh, whether you see it on a daily basis or not, we're serving people in all four of our nonprofit entities in some way, shape, or form that are from every uh, part of this county to include Boynton Beach. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, Mr. Edwards, I'm going to ask you a question that's very dear. You almost said it. The money that Goodwill raised in Palm Beach County, it remains in Palm Beach County. Am I correct in saying that? That that is absolutely correct. Now we cover five counties. Now, don't worry about that. I'm worried about Palm Beach yeah, County. Yeah, Palm now, Beach you, County. I, absolutely. Money raised in Palm Beach County remains in Palm Beach County that's to correct. help people that live in Palm Beach County. It serves our that, programs that, that's it, and sir. services. You said yes. Thank you. That's what I need yeah. to hear. You're good. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, you have a copy for the clerk as well. Why don't you give us those? We could pass them down. We, we can go home early. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Mayor, commissioners, city staff, thank you. And thank you for again for giving us the opportunity to uh, 
to be here and to, uh, to make this presentation. Um, uh, my name is Mark Douglas. I'm the uh, chairman of Florida Textile Recycling Programs. Uh, I've been in this industry now for uh, 32 years. Uh, we've had stores up here in Palm Beach County over the years, um, and we've had actually textile recycling bins in operation for the last 30 years. Uh, with me is uh, John Ferguson, who is uh, uh, who has over 30 years uh, of experience, previously served as an executive and president of All Service Republic Industries, and our counsel, uh, Andre Park. Um, we, have hit, um, uh, we have had some of the same issues with these unscrupulous operators that have dropped bins all over the place without people's permission, uh, per city, uh, same as them. And, uh, and every commission meeting, um, uh, and other uh, uh, sustainability meetings, uh, roundtables. Goodwill has always uh, decided that they were not in the bin business, never have been, and nor uh, they were the biggest proponent of banning bins from ever being in any city. So the fact that they're here is, is surprising to us, uh, but nonetheless they are. Um, we currently have a contract with the Habitat for Humanity here in Palm Beach County where we have uh, bins at three of their locations and we pay them for every uh, pound of textiles that comes into their locations. We also have three bins here at schools here in, in Boynton um, currently and we pay those individual schools based on the amount of textiles that are contributed to uh, the schools and it's, it's a wonderful program for the schools from an educational standpoint, an environmental standpoint, and a financial standpoint. Um, when this RFP was first submitted, we believe the intent was to increase the levels of sustainability in the city of Boynton Beach. Option A, which is what we bid on, is the most impactful of all the options with respect to achieving this goal while me making recycling easier for all of the city of Boynton Beach residents. Our FTL program is a comprehensive, professionally run municipal program for citywide textile recycling that has evolved and been on the cutting edge of innovation by utilizing the technologies to enhance efficiencies and sustainability. The FTRP program is the first and only program in the state of Florida in existence that has been adopted by government aid entities and has proven successful in removing millions of pounds from local landfills over the last three years. FTRP in just over three years has contracts currently with the town of Davie, Marion County, the city of Hollywood, and the Duval County Public School Board. Every single bin that we have throughout the state of Florida, we have a contract on. In the town of Davie alone, since inception, which is March 31st was three years, the program has generated in excess of $360,000 in revenue and vouchers, and over 4.1 million pounds of textiles have been diverted from the local landfills. In the city of Boynton Beach, with 50 bins in the same three year time frame, 4.1 million pounds can be diverted as well and with the tipping fees would generate substantial additional savings over and above the $2,000 per year per bin that we have placed in, in, in our offer. Um, our program uses innovative te techniques and technology that is head and shoulders above any competitors to not only enhance sustainability, but also reducing the carbon footprint by only servicing those bins that need servicing. Sensors and software are unique and track not only all the poundage per bin, which the system saves for future review by city staff, but also the volume of tonnage removed from the waste stream and further allows the city to forecast the reduction of disposal savings the city will see as a result of this program. Um, you have a handout right in front of you which shows a couple of snapshots of what the software does. Um, on the first page, it's just uh, every bin, when it is serviced, there's pictures taken of inside the bin, outside the exterior of the bin. We are responsible for cleaning up within a 10-foot radius of every single bin. We have eyes on every single bin on a daily basis, but we only service the bins as needed by the sensors. We get text and email notifications as these bins are filling up. On the next page, it shows a list of the bins and they're all color-coded. 
So yellow, uh, green, green represents zero to 50 percent in uh, the fill levels of the bin. Yellow is 51 to 75 percent, and red being 75 to 100 percent. The third page shows uh, uh, reporting requirements and, and tracking of expenses, the distance, estimated driving time, everything is monitored and kept track of for efficiencies and sustainability. Um, the next page is a picture of what uh, Goodwill submitted, uh, which has an open chute. These bins are not only unsafe, they're not secure, but FTRP, we stopped using these bins almost 20 years ago because of the inefficiencies of these bins and the fact that somebody actually died trying to steal something out of these bins. The picture of our bin is on the final page. It is a galvanized steel bin, powder coated paint with a mailbox type chute for safety and security. FTRP also sets up websites called textileprograms.com forward slash Boynton Beach, where residents can view the most convenient locations of these bins to their home or office. FTRP is the only company that has a comprehensive hurricane preparedness plan in place to move or remove bins to safe locations in case of a storm that has proven successful in other municipalities from the storm that just was here six months ago in September. FTRP's voucher program of $5,000 per year far exceeds our competitor's offer of $500 for year one, $1,000 for years two and three, and we will be made available from a local convenient business of the commissioner's choosing here in Boynton Beach. FDRP participates in citywide programs such as household hazardous waste events, paying the city of Boynton Beach additional revenue above, again, the $2,000 per year per bin for all additional textiles collected at every one of these events. The FTP, FTRP Recycling Rewards Program allows local businesses to provide coupons of their choice to, prov to reward residents for recycling their textiles while increasing foot traffic to their local businesses in the city. FTRP bid for 50 bins at $2,000 per bin, which is $100,000 per year, plus CPI annual increases, plus its voucher program, plus the additional clothing drives, the recycling uh, credits, um, and the citywide disposal savings far exceeds any other offer received. FTRP is the only company with municipality contracts and experience in running and operating a successful, comprehensive, professionally run citywide textile recycling, recycling program, and we hope preference will be given to contracts with other government entities that we already have. We hope the city of Boynton Beach will choose option A. I'd like my attorney, Andre Park, just to say a few words, if you may. Well, I believe I believe we we may have been over over a limit. Two minutes. So, one minute. Look, I, I'm I'm not gonna I'm just gonna reiterate a little bit what Mark said. Uh, when you're talking about qualifications, you're talking about which entity has a specific initiative, a governmental initiative within the state of Florida. There's only four of them. We have all four of them. So this is a sophisticated an extremely complex system. It's not simply dropping a box at uh, specified locations or having a store in neighboring jurisdictions. It's specifically a complicated state-of-the-art 21st century program that's made for sustainability and to drive efficiencies. It's a marriage between technology and human capital. We don't need to have a thousand individuals um, who may or may not be involved in the bins. Uh, simply put, the, te the sensors let us know when it needs to be filled and we address that. And as Mark indicated, we hoped, as indicated in your scope of, ser of, your scope of services of your RFP, that we would have received the uh, additional preferences for those four contracts, but apparently we did not. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Katz. A couple questions. Um, 
you just made reference to you know one of my my initial points that the the revenue generated by the city would, city would be um, you know at least one of my if not the biggest motivating factor besides you know the maintenance of the bins and and you know proper upkeep. Um, is it your intention to to try to place fifty bins to you know to hit that one hundred thousand equivalency and then also you made reference to other uh, fees and and you know parts of parts of revenue that would come to the city. Could you elaborate on those more? You said um, tipping fees, vouchers, and so forth. What what would be an, an annual estimated dollar amount that the city could expect to see? You know, within you know a, a two year period of, of getting set up. Um, well, the, the 50 bins is not necessarily 50 locations. 50 bins could translate into 30 to 35 locations. Okay. Uh, we, all, we have uh, national contracts with some of the bigger property management groups in the country, and we've already gotten commit commitments on three shopping centers here in Boynton Beach. That, of course, would be with assuming we were awarded the program and that with staff's approval on those particular shopping centers. Um, the revenue to the city would be a minimum of, uh, of $100,000 a year year, um, plus the voucher program, which is $5,000 a year. Uh, depending on how many uh, city-wide events that the city has throughout the year, we would make a truck available and personnel. Any textiles collected at those events, we pay the city an additional $0.10 cents per pound for every textile that comes along with those. Uh, there's CPI increases every year. Uh, over and above the hundred thousand dollars, and then there's the disposal savings. Uh, in a city that's similar sized uh, to this, like we have in Davie, where in the three years since that program has been running, uh, they've received over three hundred and sixty thousand dollars, um, and they've—I uh, uh, don't know—I don't remember what the tipping fees are in Davie, but I think up here in Palm Beach County they're forty-two dollars a ton. So if we kept uh, four point million, four point the same four point one million pounds out of the landfills, that would be approximately another $85,000 in additional savings available to the city. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, in regards to your bins, I I'm just saying I see that you have the city logo on these, and I'm, I'm just saying, uh, did you get permission to do this? That is, is a that rendering that we submitted for the sta city and staff's approval. We took, uh, we got uh, uh, a copy of the logo uh, sub uh, sent to us from staff, and our oh, marketing okay. person oh, you, put you that on the You said yes. Okay, I'm through with that. Let me go to page 30 because I, I find it kind of ironic. You all your pages, you know, and then you throw it here to us, rather to me. Visual samples of recycling collection of donation boxes for Gulf Stream Goodwill, and I'm, I'm like saying, you know. Here you all are trying to persuade us, and then I see stuff, and you open shoots. This is yours, page 30. That's Goodwill's bin. But this is your proposal that you gave to us, sir. Yes, sir, that's correct. Thank you. That's what I'm going to go on. You said, first of all, it's unsafe, not secure. I don't know who wrote this, dangerous. Goodwill has zero bins, third-party bins. FTRP stopped using almost 20 years ago. And if I was going to be doing a presentation, I don't think I'd have stuck something in there like that. That's just my quorum about your presentation. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? You mentioned you have these already in three schools. Yes, sir. What, in this particular area? Yes, sir. In Boynton, we have, um, it's at um, South Tech Academy. Just put my glasses on a second. We have been at South Tech uh, Charter Academy, South Tech Preparatory Academy, and Imagine Schools Chancellor. How long have these bins been there? Um, one, uh, two of them since January of 2016, and one since August of 2016. Can you give me an idea, like what the poundage of? Textiles you're picking up out of these particular bins? I, I wouldn't know that offhand. Yeah. I can get that information for you. Okay. Another question. Yes. City staff, uh, the three schools that he just stated, uh, did they are they permitted? I'm just saying, do they get no? Uh, my understanding is they have not gone through the permit process. They haven't. Well, if that's the case, can you tell me how many have gone through the permitting process?
What I can tell you, Mike Rump, Planning Zoning Director, probably over the past two years, there's been a couple companies that have come to us and attempted to place them on properties. And for different reasons, they did not qualify and were not able to. But we haven't permitted anybody in the city. You know, if there had one actually gone through the permit process, it had been a few years ago and I don't remember it, I'd processed or reviewed some applications. But the best of your knowledge, has there been any permits given the past these couple bids? years, no. Okay, thank you. A, a point yes. of clarification, aren't schools outside of our jurisdiction in terms of these bins? Currently, don't have an exemption process or exemption standard for our process. Uh, same manager, if you can clarify, because our conversation this morning, I remember you said something about uh, schools and churches. Oh, according to the current, yes. Um, what has been arranged now, but we're, if we're talking about the current process, the current regulations, there is not an exemption for um, different uses or properties. Recommending exemption through, if we move forward with this program, to exempt schools and houses of worship. Meaning excluding them from the exclusivity, exclusivity. Franchise aspect. <laughs> yes, Vice Mayor. I mean. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Um, uh, just a question for uh, F, F, whatever. Sorry, I can't remember your acronym. But uh, you mentioned that there will be sensors inside of the apparatuses to determine uh, levels of, of trash. But yes, what about cameras or sensors outside of the bins? Because again, I think one of the main concerns that we have up here is individuals dumping uh, couches or, or, or debris outside of these bins and therefore they're sitting out there for a weekend or for days and no one's picking them up. So how do you guys keep track of those bins and, and, and are aware whether or not that there's some type of uh, other stuff around them, surrounding them? Yes, ma'am. The sensors measure the, only the fill levels inside the bin. We have a dedicated person in every municipality that we, in, we are in that goes around with a van and or truck and visits every single location every single day to make sure that there's nothing ever left outside. And if it is, they remove it immediately. Seven days a week? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Seven days a week? Yes, sir. And also, by the way, to answer, get back to the school question, we have a school program. We're in almost 70 schools in Broward and Palm Beach County, and we have permission from every single school that we're in. Funds that's collected for the schools, they're used by the schools, right? The funds that are collected by the schools, they are used by the schools, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. We write a check to the school once a month for all the poundage that is collected on a monthly basis. And goodwill is used countywide. Okay, you answer my question. Okay. So, yes. Last question. Um, this is for staff. If the contract would be awarded to for the Part B of this, which is city-owned since uh, this entity applied for both, what would be the cost differential between what Goodwill is proposing and what uh, they are proposing? Can anybody uh, get me that number real quick? So it would depend, obviously, on the number of bins. Um, the Florida Textiles um, offered for city-owned property, uh, $1,200 a year per bin. Um, the Goodwill I believe mentioned 10 sites, and I don't want to speak for them, but I believe they mentioned 10 sites um, for their monthly amount, which was 83.92, I think, per month. That came out to the 99,000. Um, I don't know how many bins. Uh, so we don't have a fixed number from Florida Textiles no. on that, so we, no. there's really no way to estimate. Right. Do, do you? On the on this on the city-owned property, uh, we didn't specify a specific amount of bins. It would all be based on on how many bins the staff would allow us to put out there. Okay, so I, I believe that leads me to a follow-up question, which is, you mentioned something earlier about a hundred thousand minimum. So, do you have a particular number in mind for your for-profit business that you need to uh, reach that? this project would be profitable for you? Is there a number that is in mind for you in order to make that possible? 
or achievable. Well, for the for the city uh, citywide property, that's why we we would hope to put out and up to 50 bids. We may not be able to put out as many bins as that. It depends on how many bins are approved by the city, and also once that is approved, then we have to go out and speak to local business owners and get their approval. Some may want to participate in the program, some may not. Some we have to pay rent in order to be on those properties, like those other commercial shopping centers that I mentioned that could be available to us. We are, we have to pay them an annual rent to be there, payable monthly. And so therefore then that revenue does not come to the city. It would go to that business owner that lets you rent on their property? No, uh, the $2,000 per year per bin gets paid to the city regardless of any monies that we have to pay out over and above that to any property owners. I see. Thank you for clarifying. You mentioned uh, earlier, you already have 30 set sites already uh, secured here in the Boynton area? No, no, no. We have, we have three shopping centers three shopping. that have offered us the, the ability to place the bins on there. Uh, here in Boynton. Uh, each one of those uh, shopping centers would be able to hold probably two to three bins. Um, but again, that would be, uh, we, we submit those locations first to the staff for, per, for approval, and then uh, we ask, you know, then we would go uh, sign the lease with those property, with those business owners. How comfortable do you feel if the city was to give you 10 sites to set your bins up and to reach that magic number of 50? Oh, I think that would be very, very easily doable, because we we very easily have uh, 50, 50 bins in in Davy with the opportunity to put up to seventy, and the same situation in the city of Hollywood. Okay, well, we're talking Boynton Beach here. Yes, sir. Did you feel comfortable that you could get fifty bins? No yes, problem. Sir. Okay. Yes, sir. And regardless, we if 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 we were not even like for example in Davy right now we have 48 bins, but we're still paying for 50. So the guarantee would be the hundred thousand dollars a year for the city uh, wide program. Uh, my thought process is that the more bins you have, the, the bigger the tipping fees, the more more of that. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely comes in. Okay. And it also allows us to service all of the residents in the city of Boynton Beach properly because it makes it convenient for them, as convenient as possible, for them to dispose of their textiles in a proper manner. Yes, Commissioner McCray, then Commissioner Katz. Thank you, Mayor. My take is, and I'm gonna be honest, I don't wanna wake up one morning and see 50 bins of anybody's all strung out through this city. I don't think we're hurting that much but revenue that we got to go and do something this drastic. I'm just saying goodwill has been established and. And I don't know, the 10 bins, that's fine with me. I'm, I'm just saying, I don't want us to become a bin complacent city. Everywhere I look, I see a bin here, drop this off and drop this off and drop this off and drop this off. Because we're going to be creating problems. I'm just saying, I'm looking down the road. That's my opinion. Thank you. Yes. Did you say that regardless of, and I don't know if the city attorney could comment on this, regardless of how many bins you actually placed it, part of your agreement would be to establish a, a payment for 50 bins? Yes, sir. So even if you only found 12 sites and put 20 bins up, you would annually pay the city 450 under if that was the That's you know, correct. Well, we would hope to be able to put out substantially more bins than that to know in order to make the program work, yes. <laughs> All right. Um, my question is, is that you said you paid the schools per tonnage? Yes, sir, per pound. And did our RFP not allow uh, a payment based on the tonnage that was collected? I think it asked for a, a per bin. I think it was per bin. Okay. All the school for all the school program we pay ten cents per pound. The same thing like the extra events that we would participate in within the city, that would be additional extra revenue to the city as well based on ten cents per pound. The trucks would get weighed and then the following week the, the city would receive an additional check. Okay. I mean, one of the things is that, you know, is the accountability. And so, like, would you be able to give us the tonnage amount? Absolutely. Right. We report the tonnage. We Every month, along with the check, you receive not only the tonnage reports that were kept out of the landfills for that particular month, but also a list of every single bin that's in the city. If any ever move, you, get it, uh, they, they receive that once a month. And the amounts. As well as the amounts. Okay. Commissioner McCray. And Thank you. Let me ask the question again another way. Money that you make over the $100,000, what do y'all do with that money? Well, we sell, the, we sell all of the merchandise. 
that's how we're able to continue to, to, to pay the city and pay expenses. We have similar expenses, the same as Goodwill does. Uh, we have trucks and labor, insurance and overhead and warehousing, stores, the same, ex same exact expenses as they have. That's another way. Do y'all donate to nonprofit organizations? I'm, I'm just saying, forget schools. I'm just saying, you know, like there, there have been citizens within Boynton, and I'm just saying, you know, I, I hate to, you know, say that you all make this money and take it out and go and, and it's, it bothers me. I'm, I'm just saying, I don't see where you're giving money back to nonprofit organizations here within this city that's, you know, helping people that's less fortunate. This is my concern. Well, the voucher program that we offer for $5,000 is this, this, the commission can determine where and who they want to help in the city with those vouchers. We don't, per se, give directly to any nonprofit organization, but we do support and all people in need. We're always willing to help. Our stores have always given stuff away to needy people as, 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 as they come in. But I will point out, and, and, um, and, and again, I'm not trying to knock our competitor, but people, Goodwill, when, when they collect merchandise here in the Boynton Beach area, that merchandise doesn't necessarily stay in the Boynton Beach area. That goes to their processing, main processing facility, and then they distribute it throughout the county. So merchandise that's given by Bo uh, Boynton Beach residents, or for that matter in any municipality, doesn't necessarily stay in that municipality. Sir, I'm not worried about the merchandise that's staying here. I'm worried about the funds that are generated. I'm just saying whether they get them from Belglade or where they spend money here in Boynton. This is my concern. I'm not worried about, you know, if I give you a suit, you get 20 cents back to Boynton. That's not my concern. My concern sure. is what are you all giving back to this city? And I'm not seeing where you all are giving something back to this city like Goodwill will be doing for people, you know, less fortunate. And I'm sorry, this is, this is my take. I understand. Any other questions from uh, our FRTP? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, so commission, do we have a motion? Do we have a second? Do we have any further discussion? Commissioner Katz. Yeah, just to, you know, I'll summarize my point and I'll state where, where I stand. Um, just like uh, Commissioner McRae, I, it had to be a good four or six months ago at least that, that I met with, uh, you know, the operators um, of Florida Textile. And, and, you know, I was intrigued by the idea that um, these bins would be, you know, heavily regulated and maintained, whereas right now if, if you go throughout the city, um, you know, as, I guess as stated by staff, Right now, none of the bins, you know, to the best of our knowledge in recent years have, have been, you know, approved, so they're unregulated. Um, it was twofold. One, that I like the idea of a, a constant regulation, self-regulation by virtue of the, the business model itself, and then and two, by the, the intuitive nature of the bins and the, the technology, I guess, that, that's involved in the bins. Um, it, obviously, nobody wants to oppose goodwill. Uh, you know, that's, that's not the position. Um, I'm taking, but at the same time, I don't know if, you know, we, we put this out to attract a bid to, to provide these, these bins and, and, and Goodwill submitted a proposal essentially by their own admission to, uh, to limit or prevent bins, you know, as it has been their, their position, um, you know, in, in, in their interest to support their, their organization and what they provide to the community. Um, I just I don't know if I feel comfortable supporting a, you know an attempt to to limit the recycling collection um, you know by virtue of only asking for city city property and and limiting the number of bins that would limit the number of, of recyclables that would be deposited in these bins and, and the opportunities for residents to do that um, so it's again I'm not Nobody opposes what Goodwill does, and that, that's not my position here tonight, but I, I do like the opportunity to see a, a new business enter the city, provide revenue for the city, um, you know, and contribute in a meaningful manner, you know, uh, environmentally by recycling, you know, the wares that are, that are dumped into their bins. Um, I just, you know, I like the opportunity to see something new, 
Um, I know that you know obviously this would be competition for goodwill, but I don't I don't suspect that given you know goodwill stature in the community and their their probably how much of the market share they possess by virtue of, of having been around that this is this is not some some crippling contract and it's not going to destroy their business by any means and it just it's it's a peculiar position to be in to say that because there is an established entity we should not allow a, a competitive entity to to enter into the marketplace i don't i don't know if that's if that's necessarily something I feel comfortable with, you know, for, for those reasons, also the fact that what, what's been stated tonight, you know, I'm taking as the revenue for the city will be in excess of the, the bid uh, that was put forth to goodwill. You know, I'd, I'd like to, to offer a motion and support um, for Florida textiles pending, you know, the, the stated position that even if they only find the ability to secure 10 bin sites or place 20 bins total, um, that that their their agreement with the city stipulates that they would be paying four or fifty bins, regardless of how many are are placed. So that's that's the motion I'll offer is to support Florida Textile for the citywide contract uh, for those various reasons. I'll second that, and uh, I I'd just like to add that uh, I'm a big supporter of Goodwill. I I go up to the. Uh, center up there on uh, Old Boynton Road and uh, drop off many of outgrown clothes. And I will continue to do that. But uh, you know, if we're gonna vote on having bins here, I, I like the high tech that uh, Florida Textile Recycling brings in. And what really stood out to me in that uh, the whole discussion is the seven day monitoring where they have somebody actual drives around in the van and checks each box individually. I like that. Um, so there can be no mistake on the, you know, what's hanging around those boxes uh, and it's taken care of uh, quickly. So uh, I will second that motion for Florida Textile Recycling Programs. I'm gonna uh, echo uh, Commissioner Casella's statements regarding the, the seven day monitoring and the technology involved um, with these bins. And I think that was kind of my major points to pick FRTP. All right, yes. Um, the discussion as we move forward with this. Um, I simply just want to put my two cents in here. Um, first and foremost, I'm going to kind of take this from a business perspective. Um, you, you have a an organization that uh, in, in the past has uh, basically stood in juxtaposition to um, what is actually happening tonight, which is to put bins out. Um, on the contrary, you have another organization that uh, has uh, stated that if it potentially is even at a loss to them, they're willing to place their bins here. Um, it, it's uh, Both sides seem to kind of confound me in terms of business ethics, not not ethics, but, but, but just business practice. Uh, it, it just both sound like uh, practices that, that just don't necessarily make sense business-wise, but um, I mean, if we have it on the record and if our attorneys can work out the deal that uh, FTRP is proposing here, which is if we have um, a, a limited number of sites, but regardless of the number of sites, the uh, applicant is willing to pay out the promised uh, or set amount, then I'm willing to move in that direction with them. Um, again, my main concern here is that we do not become a city that becomes um, I'm just uh, inundated with uh, mismanaged bins. That is my major concern here. We have a tremendous uh, uh, effort that we've put forth with approving Town Square. We're trying to rebrand our city. We're trying to make sure that this is a city that all who live here can be proud of. Therefore, um, uh, uh, supporting this is is it's making me nervous. But again, I'm doing this with the. Uh, faith in FTRP that they will uh, hold themselves to these uh, facts that they have stated here publicly in front of the uh, um, the city and in front of us as the commission. I'm, I'm going to be, uh, you know, I, I'm sure myself and other people will be closely monitoring these bins to make sure that, as stated, that seven days a week there is never a piece of trash or something that's left around it for longer than a 24-hour period. Um, that being said, I'll be willing to support that motion made by uh, Commissioner Katz. Thank you. I 
I will not be voting in favor of this because I'm just saying, you know, since they did such an exceptional job, you know, in other places, so they say. I'm just saying I didn't see anybody bringing no testimonies in here. I'm just saying, you know, that we're happy with what they're doing. They kept their word. And I'm just saying, I'm going to ask the city attorney, is there anything going to be in this contract? I'm just saying if we said that there's a problem that we could breach this contract, I'm, I'm just saying. Well, under the draft contract that was in the agenda package for uh, Gulfstream Goodwill, uh, there was a termination clause for convenience by the city. Um, there is no corresponding draft agreement um, if it's not for goodwill. So the, the answer to your question is any provision that this commission wants in the agreement will be in the agreement because the agreement will come back to you for approval after you designated the, uh, the prevailing proposal. Clarification again, and goodwill, that was a, a provision in there. Am I correct in what you just said? There was a provision for termination, termination for convenience by the city. Thank you. And the contract that we're there, that we're going to vote on now, because I'm not going to approve. I'm not voting for it anyway. That wasn't an agreement, a termination agreement in this clause, in this agreement, right? No provision because there was no agreement. Thank you, sir. Okay. Can I amend the motion by Commissioner Katz then to make sure that that language is included? That we have a clause for a termination of convenience. You can request if you would like to change this motion. I think that per the, the city attorney's um, previous comment that the contract has to come back for our approval, that if if we want to, I guess now's the time, yeah, um, or I guess it would we'd have to ask if they'd be agreeable to some sort of termination clause, and, and we'd have to figure out under what conditions. I don't, if, are we talking about we just decide one day we don't want them to operate anymore and, and with no, with no justification or with, with breach of their you know, their stated position, I think that I, I might feel more comfortable asking for that type of language to be crafted um, in negotiation with the, the city attorney and uh, Florida Textiles, just because I don't, I don't know what their position is or what our, our position is about what type of, of termination uh, scenarios we're, we're discussing. But I'm, I'm open to the idea of putting language in there that's amenable to both parties. <laughs> Correct. The, the the resolution that we have is for three years, um, and so the the question is is that do we you know negotiate something that after the first year or review period um, because we have not done this, and so that is something that I would also probably want to see forward is a review period. Um, is so we understand exactly what we're getting because we really don't know what's going to happen, and to bind for three years can be scary because we may be stuck with seeing 100 bins or 200 bins. And so I'd like to, you know, before we sign, okay with the contract, have a review period included. Is that uh, something you can? Yeah, I could um, amend my motion to include uh, language negotiated with, with legal and the Florida Textiles organization to, to come back to us akin to, to what we just discussed. Yes, Commissioner McCray. Question. I, I, I don't, I'm going to be honest. I think it's kind of derelict on us saying, you know, what they feel comfortable with. We are the policy makers of this city, and I'm just saying we need to set the rules, and I'm not worried about what they feel comfortable with. We are the ones who make this decision. We want it to be one year, two years, or three years. I'm, I'm just saying what they feel comfortable with. Like I said, I see no testimonies, and we need to cover the citizens here in the city of Boynton. Yes, just Commissioner to, to clarify yeah. my comments. Yeah. to be comfortable with. I mean that I assume that if we put some sort of cancellation provision in there that says in a month we could without cause terminate the contract, that might be something that they don't agree with. Um, you know, there, there has to be a fair shake here for both parties. So when I say something they would be comfortable with, I mean something that, that we ask them that's reasonable that they would be agreeable to. I'm not deferring to, to their judgment, I just I don't anticipate anyone to sign a contract with the city for anything if there's a provision that says next meeting we could cancel the contract after they've expended money establishing their you know whatever their business entity was. So a, a reasonable, agreeable position regarding a cancellation policy. So. Jim is well, what was staff nice. could correct me on this, but the request for the proposals contained provisions for a three-year contract term with a renewal, if possible, and a cancellation provision that says the city reserves the right to cancel this agreement with or without cause 
effective 30 days from the date of the written notification. So both submittals were submitted pursuant to that limitation of rights on the part of whoever is awarded it. So the city commission controls that in the appropriate circumstances as you determine. That was already included? Well, that was the requirement for the request for proposal, so. Even if it was not in their proposal. By virtue of applying for the RRFP, they had already agreed to this. Okay. Anybody want to, anybody disagree with that interpretation, either on staff or the the um, proposers? No, the draft, Tim Howard, the uh, draft agreement that was included in the RFP was exactly as Jim stated. That's a standard termination that we have in our, all of our draft contracts that are included with the RFPs. Not saying that the commission can't change that to 60 days, um, but the standard is 30 days. Vice Mayor Romulus. Clarification on Commissioner Katz's motion. Are we, um, are you moving for the citywide or city owned? Citywide. Okay. All right. And we have, since his um, motion has not changed, we're going to accept Commissioner Casello's second. Is there any further discussion from the board? Saying none. All those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. The motion passes four to one. All right. Moving on to public hearing. Proposed resolution number R18-059, approved second amendment to the land development agreement between the city of Boynton Beach and Sky at Boynton Beach LLC, an authorized release of surety to bury overhead utility lines across Federal Highway and Southeast 2nd Avenue. Uh, yes. good, evening, good evening, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, Commission. Andrew Mack, Director of Development. Um, this, this item before you is a simple request as the uh, 500 Ocean Project is coming to completion. Uh, their develop agreement is expiring. Um, they, at this point, are requesting a refund or a release of their cash surety that they have posted with the city to, to, um, to guarantee that they would uh, have funds available to underground the utilities under Federal Highway at 2nd Street if there was a future project or if the CRA or if anybody was wanting to do that. Um, at this point, um, there's been no no uh, uh, no projects that have come forward nor uh, uh, direction that the uh, undergrounding is going to take place. So uh, staff is in support of releasing that surety at this point. Yes. What is the amount of that cash surety? 29000 one hundred and sixty six dollars, I believe. Thousand nine hundred and sixty one. You just gave him three thousand dollars. <laughs> Sorry. And sixty six. What is it again? Thousand nine sixty one sixty six. One sixty. Yes. Motion to approve. Thank you. Thank you. All those any, uh, any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Motion passes unanimously. Proposed ordinance number 18-003, second reading. Jim. Yes, Mayor. Uh, an ordinance of the City of Boynton Beach, Florida, amending ordinance 02013 to rezone a parcel of land described herein and commonly referred to as one ocean, excuse me, one Boynton, from mixed use low district MUL to mixed use four district MU4, providing for conflict, severability, and an effective date. I have a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. Second. All right. Any discussion or further? And now I'll open it up to public comments. Seeing none. May I have a roll call, please? Yes. Yes. Commissioner McCray. Aye. Vice Mayor Romulus. Commissioner Casello. Yes. And Mayor Grant. Yes. Vote is five to zero. Ordinance 18004, an ordinance of the city of Boynton Beach, Florida, amending ordinance 02013 to rezone a parcel of land described herein and commonly referred to as timeless life care and 601 South Federal Highway from mixed use low intensity two district MUL2 to mixed use two district MU2, providing for conflict severability and an effective date. I have a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Any comments from the board? Seeing none, any comments from the public? <coughs> Seeing none, may I have a roll call, please? 
Frey. Aye. Vice Mayor Romulus. Commissioner Casello. Yes. Mayor Grant. Yes. Commissioner Katz. Yes. The vote is five to zero. Proposed ordinance number 18-005, first reading. An ordinance of the City of Boynton Beach, Florida, amending Chapter 25.1 of the City Code of uh, Ordinances regarding communications facilities and the public rights of way, implementing the Advanced Wireless Infrastructure Deployment Act, making factual and legislative findings, adopting and amending the city regulations related to, without limitation, placement, maintenance, and replacement of wireless and other communication facilities in the city's rights of way. Um, co-location of small wireless facilities on existing utility poles, placement of new utility poles, insurance and surety bond requirements, permitting procedures and requirements, appeals, safety requirements, waivers, review deadlines, definitions, registration of communication service providers and fees, providing objective design standards, providing for city commission authority, codification, severability codification, and an effective date. Yes, Commissioner Casillo. Uh, Jim, I, I'm sure the rest of the commission is uh, also. I received a uh, few emails from the uh, AT&T, Comcast, saying that they didn't have enough time to look this over. Are you familiar? Well, there'll be plenty of time to look it over because tonight is first reading of the ordinance. I've written to at least two of the people that communicated to all of you today to remind them that this is first reading that there will be second reading, that between first and second reading they could submit uh, written proposals or recommendations to staff or to you as the commission, uh, that the city commission has the authority to amend uh, the ordinance between first and second reading. Uh, so it seems to me there's plenty of opportunity to respond um, if they have not had the opportunity to do so before tonight or if they don't want to make any comments or recommendations tonight right now. Okay. Thank you. And my only uh, comment would be is that if, if approved that we um, move the second reading of, uh, to the first meeting in May to give everybody an ample opportunity to make those comments. Okay. All right. Mike. Good evening. Again, Mike Rump, your planning zone director. Um, this, is, um, this was a collaborative effort uh, involving a couple of planners in the office as well as our legal staff. So we could do a little bit of a dog and pony or a tag team show, I should, I should say. This involves various tower components um, in the city and that serve both private public entities on different scales. Uh, this ranges, of course, or also is, um, serves a couple of different purposes. Number one, first and foremost, <clears throat> the amendments are intended to bring us into compliance with state legislative actions as well as federal government requirements of the city. It also is intended to provide optimal services to the community. And lastly, to, um, to provide um, specific accommodations to, well, I'm sorry, specifically to, to um, control towers and antennas within the city for aesthetic and safety concerns. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Katie first to address the first component of this, and then I'll follow up with the second component. Good evening, Kathleen Hatcher, Senior Planner. Um, this is a city-initiated code revision to Part 2 of the code, uh, Chapter 25.1, just to update it to include the, uh, to implement the new state legislation known as the Advanced Wireless Infrastructure Deployment Act and also uh, changes that are necessary to Part 3 uh, to update the Tower Ordinance, uh, which is Section 13 uh, and also Section 12 uh, for ham radio and TV antennas. Uh, currently, we have 13 cell towers in the, throughout the city. Uh, there's increasing demand for additional um, capacity and speed. Uh, the carriers are now shifting to smaller microcell towers to meet that demand. Uh, the microcells are typically half the height of a macro cell tower, which would be around 50 to 65 feet in height. and um, 
it is estimated that each carrier will have one microcell needed for every 50 to 75 customers. That's a lot of microcells. Um, most of these will be located within public rights of way. Uh, the antennas will be attached to utility poles, lights, um, and any new structures that are put in to the right of way. Uh, the tower industry has worked closely with legislators to draft the state's uh, act and it became effective in July of 2017. Um, it does limit local government's authority to regulate these communication facilities within the public rights of way. But just so I'm clear on this. So What's this is saying that these utilities have the right to put these microcells in the public right away? Is that what basically it is? Well, there is a process where they ha would have to go through and get a right of way permit from engineering uh, to do so and standards that they would be required to meet. <coughs> it does allow the, um, the, the local governments to adopt various regulations that would govern these facilities. Um, and to establish objective design standards for okay. the location, uh, the stealth concealment requirements, spacing uh, for ground mounted equipment, uh, aesthetics, landscaping, and uh, land uses, structural design and setbacks. So that's what we have added to chapter 25.1 to address these uh, microcell towers that will be coming into the right of way so that we can control um, where they're placed uh, and what they look like and what impact they will have on pedestrians, on motorists, on the, uh, the aesthetics of the city. Oh, no, I need to. I can't sure. wait. First, do you have a, a picture of what you're talking about so the public can see? You use my towers. If people said towers, they think about something that's going up. You have a photo. Of we, I, I do at okay. the at the end of this. Um, oh, okay. Th this is an example. Thank you. Uh, it, that's that's what we don't want to see. Right. That's another example. It's too close to the curb, but it, it's an example of a stealth uh, uh, microcell tower that all the antennas are housed inside the pole. <coughs> this is another example of what they could look like. And then the, um, the other amendments are just to uh, the LDR to update the tower ordinance to take out the, um, the, the non-concealed attached um, tower uh, antennas um, to exclude those regulated by Chapter 25.1. So that only leaves ones on private property um, or public city property, but not in the right of way. And those would be limited to um, poles that are existing, like ball, uh, ballpark lights or um, you know, large poles where they could uh, attach antennas. And then the other section of the, uh, the revisions that are proposed is just to the ham radio, the amateur radio uh, antennas and the um, the TV uh, satellite. I think you had something on that. Question. Um, if you can speculate, is it safe to assume that the, the handful of emails we received today by the major telecommunication companies is is going to be their objection to any any of the standards that you put in place to to maintain aesthetics and, and things of that nature? Is that is that safe to assume that that they don't want to follow additional guidelines. Well, we understand at this point in time, if, if it's true it has been said that they've not had time to review it, I think the reactions could be out of just worst case scenario. They're not sure. They want time to review it and they feel as if they've been caught off guard. That's not our, we don't believe that's true. We, we, first and foremost, the majority of what you'd see in the changes proposed are consistent with, with statutes. It's, it's, a lot of it is verbatim. 
and what isn't, our own standards are basically what we feel is, is necessary to protect our city. Understand too, um, we've got three different jurisdictions overseeing roadways in the city, two higher than us, and really our sole jurisdiction control is over our local streets, which is in residential neighborhoods, which has a great potential for being impacted versus higher corridor streets which have FPL power poles on there to begin with, a lot more signs and poles, um, they may not be as effective, particularly if you co-locate on those existing poles. That's outside our jurisdiction. So again, not to again ask you to speculate, is it reasonable to assume, based on what you just said, that you know Verizon and AT&T and you know any of these companies are are well aware of the law that was passed and well aware of the the ability of local governments to do what we're doing, and so they. They're equally or more familiar with what happens at state below okay. level. Absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> they have a lot more to gain. So, yeah. that's that's what I was that's what I was thinking. Um, and so so with that, in that vein, um, it would, with respect to to the mayor's desire to give them more time, I think that they've probably they've probably crunched the numbers and figured out exactly what their position is. Um, so I, you know, I'll express my support for this and 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 request that we stick to the original timeline of the second reading just because I don't I don't believe that Verizon is not aware of, of all the details as you just indicated as they probably are. And of course staff is going to avail itself to any of the entities that contact us or who have not already contacted us um, to provide information and, and dialogue. Question. In regards to bearing of utility poles here in the city of Boynton, are we seriously thinking about that? I'm sorry, one more time. In regards to bearing of the utility lines here in the city of Boynton, oh. are we seriously thinking about that now? <clears throat> uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, we're reviewing larger projects with uh, priority to, to try to encourage that, if not require it, yes. Where it makes feasible sense, absolutely. Thank you. That is a part of our... Uh, consolidated plan is it not to underground everything? If it is, yes. Yeah. So um, I guess because we're asking questions in the middle, um, does uh, Leisureville count as a retirement community? Because we have two Leisurevilles, would they go together or would they be separate to be as part of the exemptions for the the statute? Because it says a retirement community of 5,000 residents or more. Top of my head, I don't know the population counts over there. Okay. So I can't answer that question right or, here. And then the other thing is that what do we have, you know, do we have something specifically for the stealth in our code for all of these micro towers? Or do you have uh, not not certain requirements um, what the stealth would look like. There are options what they could go with, but we do have um, stealth tower, uh, requirements for stealth towers, uh, macro cell towers in certain locations depending on the zoning. I think in our LDR we also define some terms like that like stealth. Uh, it's enclosed in something that represents something normal to a streetscape. And the antennas are either also disguised or they're just they're within the structure itself. So I think we have enough to guide us. Yes. Okay, because I was just reading the statute and it talks about reasonable location, context, color, stealth, and concealment requirements. And so we have something regarding all of those, um, I guess, qualifications for these micro towers in our LDRs. The structure we have now applies specifically to the larger scale cell towers, telecommunication towers, not necessarily these smaller scale ones, but I think it well, is still applicable that, in, so in concept. My question is, is the new one that we're, has it in their language regarding what we are looking for with the location context, color, stealth, and concealment requirements? Um, I believe there are definitions included in Chapter 25.1. And the stealth design is up to the uh, the carrier, the applicant, to come up with and for staff to review. Uh, each one is going to be very different looking. Some are going to be like, like what you see on the screen now. Uh, others are going to be more like a, a, a light pole or you know, power. a power pole. So I mean. it's, it's going to vary and be reviewed by staff. 
Okay. It's, you know, basically my, my question is, is that, you know, because I'm not going to be here at the next meeting, is that we, you know, make sure that that the approval is, you know, that each poll that comes up, that the city approves it based upon those four contexts or contact, um, qualification of context, color, stealth, and concealment requirements so that, you know, if they, they it includes a, a waiver period that has to be answered within 45 days, but we want to make sure that staff reviews each one for those four uh, qualifications. So are we ensuring, because from what you're saying, each um, provider can come up with their own design, so are we going to in, uh, ensure uniformity? That way we're not having red, green, orange poles all over our downtown and all over our city? Yes, it does need to be consistent with the poles around it and, um, and blend in. Uh, so it, it can't be a, a, a different color, and it, it would need to be, uh, the antennas would need to be concealed, and it would need to look in proportion to uh, the pole. And there's, there's several things that we would look at to make sure that it, it would be consistent with, with the area. My concern being that this ordinance would uh, come into play as soon as we approve it after the second reading, what about then when we create and build downtown, if they've already built out poles that look like what we currently have in place and then we go and change them a couple of years, do they have to renew to our, our updated standards or how does that work? I think first, and I want to repeat what I said earlier, and that our jurisdiction is really just over the local streets. And when we talk about downtown, you're probably talking about some of the more principal roadways. Boynton Beach Boulevard, Seacrest, US 1, segments of Ocean Avenue are both county or state or, or local. Um, those within the neighborhoods, the residential streets, is where we would be looking for some type of continuity. And perhaps we can look at the CRA plan. When they come in with new components, we might look and see if there is some opportunity for furthering or implementing the plan with, with you know, branding of some type of pole. We'll have to, fortunately, have to take it as it comes. There's no further presentation motion to approve. Is there anything else? There is the um, shortwave section if you'd like to um, see a presentation. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Next section involves um, shortwave radio, also known as ham radio, towers and antennas, regulation processes. Uh, also, I'll touch upon briefly um, another portion of the section involving um, dish antennas. Uh, let me just touch upon it. It's very simple. In order to comply with federal requirements, we've added an exemption provision so that if it is a of a certain size, it's exempt from the standards that are in here. Again, that's strictly to comply with um, federal requirements. That's a dish antenna of Is it one meter, three meter, one? I've gotten a lot of guidance on this section from our local experts in the, in the city, including um, Harry Woodworth, who is both an electrical engineer and um, a um, uh, operator, um, hobbyist in, in the whole work. So he's, he's been a real great help in helping me understand the standards. Um, let me also say something important. We, um, we've been working on this in a rather short time frame. We were trying to catch up. And in a perfect world, we would have had all these regulations in place shortly after the um, state statutes became into effect. Um, also, it's been some time we've been riding with regulations that are possibly preventing um, shortwave operators from um, exercising their rights, <clears throat> as well as contributing to um, emergency circumstances with, with taller antennas. I have been contacted over the past couple of years by a couple operators asking about what the regulations are and indicating to me and hinting and supplying me with information um, about uh, consistency with federal requirements. Here we are. Um, we continue to work on some of these provisions, particularly Katie's section involving the rights of way um, processes that we're going to be instituting. We're, we're reviewing that now and bringing others into play that are going to have a role in that. 
Um, even before we were contacted, we knew that we were kind of have the potential for touching it up before second reading. Um, so we're, it's, it's still in the works, and we're still reviewing a couple things. Like I said, particularly involving processes and fees and, and things like that. Um, anyway, let me touch upon this real quickly and try not to get too technical. But <clears throat> right now, well, let me just use this as a guide. It'll make it go smoother. Um, the basis for the amendments, um, we, have, we currently lack provisions for shortwave radio communications. We specifically speak to telecommunication towers, um, CB radios, and television antennas. Um, we do not recognize the federal and state requirements and specifically the requirement to provide reasonable accommodation for this service. Um, these requirements at the federal level and the state level are really coming out of um, uh, FCC PRB1, which states that the cities cannot um, preclude amateur service communications. Um, there's also um, important resolution of Congress which states the importance of it. I'm not going to go through each one of these, but stop me if I'm moving too quickly and you want to see something. But it talks about the role in emergency communications and during periods of declared emergencies. It talks about advancing the technical and operating skills of our society, um, creating this, um, I like the word, reservoir of operators and electronic experts. Um, I don't know if the, <coughs> the um, fire personnel were here, but they can attest firsthand to the role that shortwave communications takes has at times when our other systems are down, and which has been proven during um, emergencies here in the state itself that we can relate to. Um, also, state statutes, um, our own local legislature has recognized those federal requirements and indicating that cities need to provide reasonable accommodation. Um, what did we do? Obviously, we um, our typical comprehensive role of examining and amending our regulations. Uh, some highlights. We reference and state the reasonable accommodation requirements and process. We limit licensed users to one ham tower. And this is, um, should note that uh, the draft regulations indicated um, antennas and not towers. We want to indicate, want to limit the tower, not the antenna, since they can co locate different kinds of antennas on a single tower. So that will be changed in second reading in the ordinance itself. Uh, indicate a maximum height. Um, indicate a maximum height when it's in operation versus when it's not in operation or use. Uh, because obviously, to be really effective and usable for a wide range of short range communications, the higher the better. Um, but when it's not in use, um, the equipment needs to be retracted, and the maximum height is proportional to the building, the single family home itself, the roof line. Uh, locations and setbacks, obviously, like all structures. Um, I like this image because, number one, it kind of looks like a typical South Florida home. Um, this tower is in its retracted or what's called a nested state, which is lowered down, most likely. A um, couple different things here. Using some terms that are in the regulations, we've had to learn and get used to. Um, they can be retracted down to different heights and they can cranked up, if you will, or those can be motorized up to the the uh, maximum height for communication purpose. A um, couple different tower examples. We have what I refer to as a lattice, but it's also referred to as a tubular, or I'm sorry, um, triangular versus tubular, which is a pole or like a monopole we might think of. Um, what this portfolio shows you or demonstrates is the different positions of the towers that they can be in, whether it's in a full operational, full height over on the right side, left side is the cranked down or nested position, and also obviously here in Florida we're all concerned with them being in safe positions during um, storm periods, and that's what the two middle images indicate, it being cranked down and then being locked down to its um, ground position. I will add that this is a pretty extensive tower style um, versus some of these um, simpler pole um, versions of it. But it also shows um, the simpler tower being lowered on the right-hand side. Michael, not to interrupt you, but are we just talking, we're just more concerned about the height and setbacks, aren't we? Uh, we don't really have to know all the no, different types, okay? So can we just move that how on? How many more Thank are there? You. No, no, speak up, speak up, that's what. <laughs> all right. Well, that, that concludes my presentation. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
but yeah, I could have ended with the one slide which gave the standard, right? Of, right. <laughs> but earlier someone correct. asked for pictures, so I was ready to give you pictures. Yeah. Okay. In, in regards to ham operators, do we still have a club here in Boynton called Ham Operators? Do we still have a club? Anybody know? And if so, how many operators do we have? Um, I did ask uh, Mr. Woodworth, and he was able to access, I think, their registry. So that is known information. Uh, I've got it in my notes somewhere, but I'm going to try and climb through those. But I could have those for you at second reading. Get them to me before yes, second sir. reading. I, I was interested you. in that, too, because I wanted to Thank know what you. the right. possibilities were of use. I'm ready. All right. Anything I'll else from the board? Commissioner Katz's motion from like 10 minutes ago. <laughs> so, can, I, can I answer one thing? Um, I indicated earlier that we are currently fine tuning some things in both sections of these regulations. And at the board meeting, a couple topics came up. One specifically related, one indirectly related to emergency communications. And one, the question was is this only limited to single family neighborhoods? or single family zoning districts and uses. The way it's drafted, yes. So we're currently considering before second reading whether it's applicable or should be applicable to um, duplexes or multifamily or townhome type um, environments. We're looking into that. We'll come back to you with something if it warrants changes in the regulations. Secondly, um, there was a question regarding, again, it's coming up with taller buildings in the downtown area. Is there a potential for these buildings? Um, as I indicated, the higher the better, better communications in these systems, and it was explained to me, and I'll save you that scientific explanation, but the higher the better. Obviously, you can have buildings downtown uh, 75 to 150 feet, and there's a potential for these of blocking these types of signals and communications. So we're also looking into possible requirements of these buildings to be built up front with the infrastructure that allows them to easily be retrofitted with the what's referred to as, Harry? What's the other word? One word. You've got to repeat it, Mike. Repeaters, thank you, repeaters. Um, to accommodate the repeaters after the fact. Not the developer would need to um, put those up, but if they have the wiring, the conduit, it makes it much simpler and, and um, relatively inexpensive to accommodate. Two topics we're reviewing before second reading. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Kess. Consulted with, you know, Harry and, and people in the industry, so, it, you know, they're... They're in agreement that these are reasonable, you know, uh, regulations that wouldn't prohibit or hinder their ability to to engage in. in That's correct. I've I've gotten pretty good support, so I understand it. Thank you. I think any like, further discussion from the board? Vice Mayor seconded. All right. Okay. And so, I, uh, Commissioner Katz, I understand that you said you wanted uh, to still have it on the April seventeenth meeting. Yeah, I just feel like if, if Verizon and AT&T have objections, that they'll probably be prepared at that date. Okay. Yeah. Well, I won't be here, so have fun. Um, oh, gee. Yeah. <laughs> All right. May I have a roll call, please? Advice, Mayor. Yeah. Mayor, yeah. I do believe I see somebody anxious in the audience with a file. Oh. Probably a lawyer wants to talk. Okay. Then, yes, if you'd like to speak, you have to come down and let me know that you'd like to speak. Not gonna read all of that. Okay. Good evening, and thank you, uh, Mayor, members of the Commission. My name is Jana Loda. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Holland and Knight with offices at 515 East Las Olas, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I'm here tonight on behalf of Verizon Wireless Personal Communications. I know earlier uh, this afternoon you all received a letter from my office on behalf of Verizon Wireless, as well as letters from a few other members of the industry uh, requesting a deferral of first reading. I understand that's uh, uh, probably not going to happen tonight. Uh, the the reason for the request is that we understand that typically if second reading occurs as they typically do within 14 days of first reading, there really isn't sufficient time to really affect any material change to the ordinance. Just because of the agenda cutoff times, um, it's, it's effectively less than a week turnaround. In my letter, I tried to provide just some quick uh, snippets of issues that we identified very quickly with the ordinance. Uh, it certainly was not a comprehensive review. But uh, just from uh, my recollection, I, I recall that the definitional section, for example, in the right-of-way ordinance uh, implements some definitions that are not consistent with state law. Actually, it looks like they've been called from the what we'll call the non-right-of-way provisions of the city code because it implicates antennas on buildings and whatnot. 
It also, uh, for the definition of co-location, co for example, it also talks about the second or subsequent antenna uh, on a structure. That is a definition that was uh, apparently called from section 365.172 of Florida statute, which relates typically to co-locations on existing towers and structures. The definition of co-location in 337.401 uh, specifically talks about an initial attachment on a utility pole. Um, there's other examples that were in my letter. Um, it is for that purpose that we had asked for the deferral. Again, understanding that's not going to happen. I had spoken with the city attorney's office. I also understand that others in the industry had spoken with other representatives of the city and that there appeared to be some willingness on the part of the city to allow sufficient time between first and second reading so that we could work with the city to craft an ordinance that not only was consistent with state and federal law, but also met what we understand are the city's objectives of aesthetic standards and objective design standards in the deployment of these facilities, which are very important to the community to assure that the network will be there in five, ten years from now to serve your constituents. So with that, um, I respectfully request that you do allow sufficient time between first and second reading so that we can offer comments to the ordinance, suggested changes to assure that it's consistent with state and federal law. One other thing I'd just like to um, highlight is that we are part of a, a, a loose working group with other members of the industry. And what we try to do to help streamline things for the city is we try to consolidate all of our comments onto one document to provide your staff so they're not having to look at five different letters or five different annotated ordinances and distilling all the different comments, but rather they just have one document. So with that, we look forward to working with the city and moving this matter forward. Thank you. Mayor, yes. before she steps away, let me yeah. suggest this. Yeah. If, and I'll pose this as a question. If I send you the uh, ordinance in word format tomorrow morning, well, would it be reasonable for you and your working group to send me your track changes and comment response by a week from today? Yeah, we actually have a standing meeting every week, and I believe we've already put this on the agenda to discuss, go through, and annotate it as a group. I'll email it to you first thing in the morning. Great. Thank you. Okay. First let and second. Let my motion stand. All right. May I have a roll call, please? Vice Mayor Ramos? Yes. Commissioner Casello? Yes. Mayor Grant? No. Uh, Commissioner Katz? Yes. And Commissioner McCrae? Yes. The vote is four to one. On to unfinished business, proposed resolution number R18-038. Been removed from the table. Second. All those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Um, I believe that we have, they're here, we'll let them. Shirley Casa, 217 Southwest 14th Street. Uh, good evening, Mayor Grant, Vice Mayor Romulus, Commissioner Casello, Commissioner Katz, and Commissioner McRae and staff. It's with disappointment and sadness that Leisureville, due to the HOA documents, and insurance cannot purchase this property. We sincerely thank the commission, staff, and residents for the opportunity to work together on a positive project. Sometimes it works out, and sometimes it doesn't. But I'm hopeful that it will remain an open green space as it was intended in 1990. Thank you. My name is Harold Ide. I'm a resident at 1003 Reposal Avenue. Several months ago, this council gave thought and consideration as to what benefit the 3.6 acre open green space leisure park site could be to the residents of Boynton Beach. One possibility, or one possible benefit, was the development of a low income housing. Another possibility was to have an interested group build a park. Well, there is a third possible plan which will benefit Boynton Beach residents. Boynton Beach, as so many cities in the country, are giving up open space because of the cost of maintaining those open space parcels. Florida has land conservation groups that would like to take ownership of this park site 
and leave it as it is open green space in perpetuity. All of the surrounding communities will appreciate the benefit of no increased traffic, no decrease in open space. Many years ago, adjacent property owners understood this parcel was given to Boynton Beach as a future park site. Once this parcel is developed, it is lost as open green space forever. So it's up to this council to decide the fate of this open green space park site. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Katz and then Commissioner Casella. Yeah, just in, in speaking to staff about, you know, what potential alternatives, um, you know, could be done and, you know, in lieu of the the fact that I'm hopeful that, that Leisureville might be able to, given some time, work around these uh, these obstacles to, to potentially obtaining and developing this into a park. Um, I'd, my position will be, and I'd request the commission to to just set set this back aside because there's no urgency to act on it and give staff time while they're kind of engrossed by town square stuff to to consider other options we discussed rfp if, if this land trust option is is another possibility um i think time would would allow for a a positive solution um as opposed to kind of a hasty decision in lieu of the withdrawal of the the attempt to purchase from leisureville I would agree. I, I don't see uh, the sense of urgency uh, to act on this now. Uh, it's been there since 1990, uh, and uh, it's not going to go anywhere. And so uh, I think we can have this in further discussions. And it's been there since creation, about 1990. That's <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so there's – we're going to let it die. No motion. All right. Next, we have legal proposed ordinance number 18-006, first reading, Jim. An ordinance of the City of Boynton Beach, Florida, amending Article 3 of Chapter 18 of the Boynton Beach Code of Ordinances entitled Municipal Police Officers Retirement Trust Fund, amending Section 18164 to provide for mutual consent regarding use of the 185 money, amending Section 18169 to add a normal retirement age definition for members who retire with a uh, year of service only retirement to provide for payment of death benefits to designated beneficiary in the event there uh, is no spouse and to add 10 year vesting for police officers hired on or after October 1, 2016, adding a new section 18178 to add a rehire after retirement provision, providing for codification, conflict, severability, and an effective date. I have a motion to approve. Second. Question. Yes. Uh, just for clarification, our current vesting period is five years now. Oh. I'll wait. <laughs> I, I I don't recall. Okay. I don't recall, but I will say this: that um, this uh, this document comes to us the. Uh, by Bonnie Jensen, uh, who represents the pension board, and um, she will be in attendance for the second reading. Uh, we'll provide um, responses to your first question, though, before then. And can I also get clarification on what that part of the adding a new section 18178 to add a rehire after retirement provision, what does that mean exactly? Uh, there was previously a prohibition under federal regulations that prevented the rehiring of employees without forfeiture of their retirement benefits. Um, so this provision uh, catches up with uh, clarification of those IRS provisions and allows that to occur under limited circumstances. And just to, just to clarify, this is this is something that's already been agreed to through a, a previously negotiated CBA. That's correct. Okay. Another question. Yes. Was, was that something that, like happened with uh, former officer Yanuzi? I, I don't remember the circumstances under which he was re rehired. 
Um, I thought, well, I, sh I shouldn't guess at what I thought that was about. Yeah, I think Scott Harris was a, probably a good yeah. example. He was a, an officer that retired from the department and was rehired on a part-time basis as a civilian because he was um, handling our forfeitures and our tow contracts. So um, I think there was concerns there with does that jeopardize his pension and so forth. So this would allow. but. I don't think we'd be able to rehire, and Tim, help me if I'm as another like if a police officer retires, we aren't going to hire that person back as a police officer again. Scott went out of the police pension and came back as a part-time employee. One, not available for any benefits. Two, it would have been if it was a full-time mm -hmm. position, it would have been in the general the general pension. As I'm sure all of you have heard over the years about an issue called double dipping into a pension fund. So if you're a police officer and you retire for, uh, and you receive a police pension, the question is, can you be rehired as another police, another position that's under that police pension? And the answer is no. But this provision allows you to be hired as a non or, or a civilian position because you're not going to accrue another police pension. But, but that wouldn't stop them from going to a different agency, different police that's agency outside. Correct. That's okay. different. They can still do that, but within the same agency. Clarification. Any comments from the board? Any comments from the public? Seeing none. May I have a roll call, please? Fellow. Yes. Mayor Grant. Yes. Commissioner Katz. Yes. Commissioner McRae. Yes. And Vice Mayor Ramos. Aye. The vote is five to zero. All right. Um, anything else? Seeing none. Mayor, Mayor, before we adjourn, you won't be here at the next meeting. Will you be out of out of the state? I will still be. I'll be up in Orlando for the public private partnerships uh, class offered by the Warrington School of Business. And you get information from people. Thank you. All right. Okay, now motion to adjourn. So move. Second. Second.